I want to thank the top team behind the glass, including the person who booked those brilliant guests for in the 11 o'clock hour. Please go back and watch it if you missed it. That is Chris Jacobs, the producer of this uh, programme. Tommy Bateson is the assistant producer. Nea Saravanchi, the vision mixer. Dave Rhodes, of course, Tech Up. Dave has been the Tech Up. Uh, Faith Eden has been the broadcast assistant. Parik Birmingham has been the video editor and the weekend editor. Phil Dave. So thank you to them. I'm back tomorrow between 10 and 1. So please join me for that. We'll continue the discussion then. Don't forget Nick Dubois is coming up in just a few minutes. He will be here between 1 and 4. I'll see you tomorrow at 10 o'clock. Hope to see you then. This is Talk TV. Want to get to grips with the stories that really matter? To cut through the spin and the BS. Want unvarnished and fiery debate? Then join us for Crosstalk. One o'clock every weekday. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of Cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. All right, oi, oi, treat girl. Having a conversation with a professional journalist, he chose to belittle her, diminish her, um, and use sexist language. I can't stand the word casual sexism. There's nothing casual about igniting and using kind of diminishing and belittling language about anyone, especially someone who's trying to do her job. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest. When a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. And when the media constantly refer to trans criminals, when they are biological men as women, we will no longer put up with these lies about our gender anymore and about our sex. Trans woman is not a woman, trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. I, that's robust. It's going to cause a, an argument. It's going to cause tension. But we've got to do it, because otherwise this country is going down the pan. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying, um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yeah. Quite yeah. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. One parent commented on a review of Peppa Pig that their daughter had begun to lash out since watching the show and added that Peppa is rude, bossy, a liar, tattletale and even more. Say it's not so. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh. It's carry on. <laughs> what just happened? <laughs> Whoa, is it? There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the fourth plinth. Mr Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I, know what's, I know what's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, <laughs> a trans... Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> just forty yeah. minutes. For... Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, you put him in an ice cream store. And once you get defeated by a guy named Begley, that's <laughs> it. You retire from politics, and you speak to Rosanna on primetime and have a lot more fun. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, had lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. They're now trying to say, hey, we've got a really clever idea for the cost of living crisis. Right. Eat cereal for dinner. But for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist did to... fail her. Yeah, we're we're supposed it was another era. That. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth.
Just when I was getting used to my show, what just happened being on talk TV every Friday night at 10.30, they go and change it. I'm furious. They've moved it to 8.30 every Friday. Talk TV, what just happened? I am furious. And welcome to the show this afternoon with me, Nick Dubois, between one and four. Now, I wasn't here last weekend. I'm going to share with you why. I went away, I nipped away to Spain for Sporting Triumph as I won the three-day Montgo Challenge Cup. And good news, if you want to see a Tory thrashed, I took a former Tory MP out there from High Peak somewhere, round there, Andrew Bridgen, and he lost convincingly... Not Andrew Bridgen. Oh, my God, how could I say that? Andrew Bridgen? No, I did not take Andrew Bridgen to play golf. <laughs> I took Andrew Bingham, and I won, so I'm in fighting form even though he was a former colleague in the House of Commons. And he's back with his tail between his legs. I'm here in the studio, delighted to be with you. Claire Muldoon oh, joins hi. me for the hi. first hour, writer and broadcaster. But before we get to the issues that you want to talk about, just a reminder, this is your show. 03444 99 1000. We will talk about what you want to talk about. But let me give you some ideas. Of course, Rishi Sunak's speech dominating the news. I bet Claire and I will be talking about that. But I've got a simple question. OK, we know what you think, Rishi Sunak, but what are you actually going to do? Is there anything he can do to advert, as he describes it, this substantive threat to democracy? What would you do? How would you, if you like, spend the money so he can back what Rishi Sunak has said, coming from his mouth. Put your money where your mouth is, but how would he do it? That's my question for you. 0344 499 1000 and lots more. Vince Cable will be joining me, former... I think he was actually a leader of the Lib Dems. They've had so many, I can't remember now. Uh, and Neil Parrish, former Conservative MP, they'll be talking about that, but we will be covering other issues. George Galloway, we've got to talk about him. What is the state of... What does it say about our state of politics that George Galloway won under those extraordinary circumstances in Rochdale? I'm not forgetting pretty much everyone else except a last-minute independent candidate. Huh. Well, they just got wiped off the face of Rochdale electorally. But we will be talking other things on a very serious note. Uh, Esther Ranson has been making uh, her presence felt around the Houses of Parliament. And now MPs are calling, or some MPs are calling for a debate and a vote ultimately on the question of assisted suicide. Let me be clear. I was always against that when I was in Parliament. I was swayed by arguments not to support it. Having been through personal experiences and seen how we treat those who are suffering and not giving them the right to assisted suicide, I have changed my mind. We will have a debate here on this show to discuss the for and against should we change the law on assisted suicide. And what's your opinion? 0344 99 1000. Mental health, believe it or not, different generations have different views, if you like, about the causes of the uptick in mental health, particularly amongst young people. The only thing they seem to agree with from generation to generation is social media has a part to play in that. But I'm asking you, are our youngsters less resilient? 0344 499 1000. And this, during the week, number 10 came out and criticised the producers of Slave Play. Now, this is a play that plans to host some of its shows for BAME audiences only. Number 10 say that's divisive and wrong. Well, are they right at number 10? Or is this actually an innovative good idea? Because the producers say that people from ethnic minority communities actually uh, are not made to feel welcome and that the theatre presently is not a safe space. 03 444 99 1000. All that and more coming up on what's going to be a terrific three hours with you joining me here on Talk TV. Claire, welcome. Hi, lovely to be here, Nick. Thanks for having lots me on. Lots to talk about, eh? Well, lots to talk about. And I just want to extend your golfing metaphor. Oh, yes, yes, Because yes. I actually think George Galloway is Sunak's handicap. <laughs> I really, really do, because that man who ran Warren Want in Glasgow, who, yeah. you know, com completely combusted with that whole charity thing, then moved away, moved back, and now, 
after licking milk mm. with ruler mm. lenska I know he's been elected. in celebrity big brother this man who's a great orator he's wonderful and this is the man that stood in front of um with his indigifacability remember yes uh, please don't remind me too much you know <laughs> and you know licking the, the milk on celebrity big brother and now he's now mp for rochdale as yeah. an independent yeah i'm actually looking forward to him shaking things up in Westminster. Well, do you Easter? think he's a positive influence? Because I find it very hard to see how he can be a positive influence. He's elected, I've got to say, therefore he has a right to his place. Yeah, of course. And I'm not one of those who, who thinks he should never have substantively. been. substantively. He did one, admittedly, extraordinary circumstances yeah. that he, he, he won in Clare. But, you know, is he more of a problem for Keir Starmer or is he a problem as you suggesting for Rishi Sunak? I think for both. Why? why I really, why? really do. Because he is, he, he's going to go in and he's going to be like Guy Fox, actually, wanting to blow up mm. the Houses of Parliament. Mm. There is so much this man can do in terms of what he'll point his finger to. And he's incredibly divisive. His th his words uh, when he speaks about Hezbollah, his words when he talks about Hamas, his words when he talks about Palestine, the Israelis, the Jews, the Muslims, Islamophobia, he's very, very strong. Well, let me sort of point to a couple of things here. I find it extraordinary in some senses that he has been elected when I think, for example, he uh, held up Saddam Hussein, Hussein as a rock of integrity and yet he killed more Muslims than anyone would be prepared to, to admit. No one seemed to take any notice of this in Rochdale. I mean, what's going on? Well, I think he's really played to the, the, the Muslim vote in, in Rochdale and he's clearly got a very good handle on what he perceives his electorate actually wants now. Vis-a-vis -vis someone like um, Lee Anderson, who shoots from the hip, who gave us those sound bites, who mm. was, you know, had the, the whip removed from the from the party, the Conservative Party removed the whip from him. Yeah. Um, but if he were to say something that George Galloway were to say, it would be completely different, I think. Uh, yeah, except, I mean, the, the reason I think Lee Anderson got in trouble is because he was wrong, actually. About, yeah. Uh, 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 and, and that's the point. He, he was wrong if, and he if, should have rode back on Lee that. Lee Anderson, all he had to say in his defence would be, I am merely, merely coming out with what my constituents are telling me. OK, his constituency is not in London. However, there are various issues up in Cumbria, I'm sure, that he has to deal with. But he would still have to give us an opinion on it. And, and the, ch the central surely charge... surely as an MP, your opinion no, is No, no, no. What I'm saying is he should make his opinion and it can reflect your constituents. Yes. Absolutely. Yes. But he should... You know, we're not elected to just mouth the opinion of our constituents. We are also elected to uh, based on what we think as well. So, or I say we, what I used to think. Yeah. So I think it would be... He would have to define himself and he clearly said that those were his thoughts. And even if he'd said that's what my constituent thinks... Yeah. You know, he was fundamentally wrong on the one point. In which case then, why do you think George Galloway has got such a good handle on Rochdale? Well, uh, look, I, I think, long I think it was a pretty obvious calculation for him mm. to make. He spoke in this election fundamentally, first and foremost, about Gaza. He mm -hmm. was speaking to the population in there, which held this as a priority, thirty-five percent, mm -hmm. I mm -hmm. think, mm -hmm. um, uh, of of that major, uh, uh, of that um, Muslim group were were listening to that. He then picked very carefully on on uh, what I would call socially conservative issues yeah. that appealed slightly beyond that more obvious group so 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 you know i i suspect he's not a, I'm, I'm guessing here yeah. but i suspect he wasn't a champion of lgbt rights or mm -hmm, something which mm -hmm, which mm -hmm. is what i would have associated with some of the things he said in the past mm -hmm. so i think he built a little bit of a coalition there and mm -hmm. then he appealed basically to but with his plans but to have I, primark i think, in I think the moving on the there's town. quite a lot to unpick here as well the way that um uh, election went in terms of postal votes there are, you know, the, the, the squeals from other parties saying that they think the, the election wasn't right and wasn't just issues. So I think we need to, I think as a, a, a a political student, I think a lot of political students would be good if they could actually unpick what happened at Rochdale. Well, yes, although um, the big question for many people is is what's the impact going to be and how will he be in, in a future general election? election? But surely, if you like, isn't there a wider message here? that the left, um, and I would say, uh, I, I think this is probably true, that the left have to, and Keir Starmer in particular, 
have to have a settled position on uh, Israel and Gaza because Keir Starmer has moved. Do you remember he, when he was basically at the beginning saying, no I would fire. tolerate cutting off water to Gaza and mm -hmm. electricity. Mm -hmm. Now he's kind of joined the sceptics of Netanyahu. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And you have to think, what was going on in their minds? Well, uh, I would actually go one step further. Let's move away from um, issues in Gaza and, you know, Sir Keir flip-flop Starmer. It's very difficult as well for him to identify what a woman is. And oh, yes, a lot of yeah. his party are struggling yeah, with yeah. that too. Yeah. Funnily enough. You know, it's 100% or nothing. You know, you can't have this 99% these hybrid versions of women. It's extraordinary. It Listen, really is extraordinary. We got our first caller in. Uh, I want to hear from you on this and other subjects, including, um, and I think, Janice, you're welcome. You're, you want to talk, talk to us. Was it about assisted suicide or was it about um, democracy, Janice? Um, I think it's, it's partly about democracy, but it's also about, it does seem that for decades, that we've allowed so many migrants in, don't have a problem with that. But what happens is they go into towns. Now, I come from West London, and I'll tell you now, there's loads and loads of towns where they, I didn't, they, where they are. Now, the problem is, uh, what I think is, what's happened is that now the uh, MPs are really getting it coming at them. They haven't thought about the public. Yeah, they so you, you're basically saying now it's on their doorstep. Right now. They, yeah, they've they're woken right. up. Yeah. You see, I, I, I have some sympathy with that view. Yeah. I, so I the gate, the old, after the horse is bolted. But listen, let, you see, part of me, now this is my theory, and I'm not sure it's going to the, stand the test of examination by Talk TV, is that actually, remember, as far back as 2005, I think, when Michael Howard was leader of the Conservative Party, he was, he was talking about immigration and the, the potential impact on public services and things like that. And he was called racist. And he actually issued a leaflet that said, it's not racist to talk immigration. Mm -hmm. and, and in a way, we've silenced critics of this sort of uh, consensus to stay quiet not talk about issues that may be changing the character, the makeup, and perhaps um, the fact that not not everyone in the country supports British values. Do, do you think, in a way, the government and we, the people, are to blame for, if you like, being cowered into not talking about some of these issues? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I what, think what that it's now... We're too scared now. But what can it's he do? Scared. What can Rishi Sunak do now? He's told us what too he late. thinks. It's too late. He's still going to let in thousands of immigrants with their dependents. He's lying about bringing in the dependents. He is going to. Do you think so? He's what, doing why do you say that? about the boats because France has said you can bring over some people where you can check these people. We, we, we're on the hiding to hell. I, I wouldn't be surprised if we don't have civil war soon. You see, I, I'm not sure we're at civil war, but we are at mm. risk of extremists. And I'm going to say this, I'm, I'm not going to caveat it, Islamic is, is, Islamist extremists, those on the, the edge who want to threaten, who, who want to intimidate and change our parliamentary system even, and of course, um, even of a, a more a, a vicious nature, those who want to cause us actual physical harm. I do see that as the threat. I don't think the British public are the threat. I think they're the threatened. No. Yeah, I think we've kowtowed too long. Janice, been clear, yeah. Janice hi, thanks for your call. We've oh, yeah, got no, uh, a budget coming up on Thursday um, and some people are saying that Rishi and the Conservatives might call a general election. I'm really interested to see how you would vote because I myself am politically homeless oh. and I'd find it, I'd struggle really hard, Janice, to find a party to actually vote for and I wondered what your thoughts were on that. Right, well, I'm absolutely petrified if Starmer gets in. We know his uh, policies on people that do wrong in this country and they can be sent back. He doesn't do it. Um, I'm, I'm scared that he's going to get bowed down, cowed down, to what the Muslims are. I'm not racist in any way, shape or form. I believe everybody has a right to believe in what they want. But when it starts coming to our people uh, who are getting frightened to speak up 
and say, this is not right. I don't know where we've gone. Why do you think people are frightened, Janice? Are you frightened to speak out and speak out? Oh, no, not me, mate. I think I think the one thing I'd say about that, um, uh, Claire, is we're very lucky on uh, Talk TV because you know we'll check people, we'll we'll challenge people, we'll question people, uh, but generally you find I think they respect the uh, ability to have free speech uh, here on yeah. the station. Janice, thank you Absolutely. very much for that. Good to hear from you. Uh, I want to read this out from Steve Medcalf. It's um it just come in on WhatsApp, and uh, by the way, you can WhatsApp us on oh three four four. For double nine one thousand, as you know, you can uh, text the word "talk" and your message also on eight seven two two two. But above all, uh, call on oh three four 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 double nine one thousand. I'll take more of your calls. But Steve's WhatsApp is interesting. It refers to what I said about assisted dying, um, uh, uh, which I I want to uh, uh, explore because he said, Nick, you said when I was an MP. I didn't support assisted dying. Now I've experienced what that means, I now do. You go on to say, does that tell you everything you need to know about the inexperienced view of MPs making such important decisions and why referenda should be used far more than they are? You hit the nail on the head of why politicians are so universally mistrusted. I, I'd say, look, that, I can see where you're coming from on that uh, score, Steve. But first of all, if you are saying, Nick, you're inadequate uh, as an MP because you changed your mind. I would say actually that's a strength, not a weakness. But also on an issue like uh, assisted dying, you consult widely with your constituents if you don't have a firm view. And I formed a view uh, that actually said there were that, that I didn't support the idea of assisted dying for a number of reasons. And we'll talk about that during the debate when it happens. And yes, then I had an experience, um, uh, a family experience, which made me see um, how wrong the law was, in my opinion. I'm quite happy to admit that. But your general thesis is, therefore, if you take what you're saying to the logical conclusion, an MP must experience absolutely everything for them to be able to be an MP, which is illogical. So for an MP to actually vote on legislation for helping disabled people should have to be disabled. That's the logic of what you're saying, Steve, which is obviously not very sensible. You can empathise and you can rationalise as an MP, and if that judgment is not approved by people, they'll vote you out, and if they think your judgment's sound, they'll keep you in. Claire, a brief word on that, perhaps. Well, assisted dying, I'm not in favour of at all, and mm. I think if we can look across the water to Canada and you'll see promoted dying. That's, eventually, that's essentially what it comes to. But they haven't to. changed the law, have they? No, but they've made it much easier for people to mm. die. And I think that is... I am very pro-life mm. from start, during, finish. I'm against capital punishment as well. So my first principle is save life at all costs. OK, right. Well, we're going to take a break now and we'll be coming back to that and more. Claire Muldoon's with me for the next hour. We'll take more of your calls as well. 0344 4 1000 or, of course, tweet me at Nick Dubois or at Talk TV. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman is not a woman, a trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right too. Yeah. Quite yeah. right too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on what <laughs> just happened. <laughs> Ooh, <we're missing. laughs> 
There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth blimp. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. <laughs> Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, a trans... Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist we're, we're, we're did fail to, her. We're yeah, supposed to have moved on from that. Era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. And uh, Dan from Kent says, Afternoon, Nick. Good to see you back in the hot seat. Yes, thank you. We can't read too much into the recent by-election result because, one, Rochdale has a 36% Muslim population who probably all voted for Gaza, about Gaza, and two, only less than half of the electorate turned out. Well, that's true, but it still is quite extraordinary, I think. Nick, um, any problems with extremism in Britain have been imported by politicians. Sunak has got a cheek warning us about the problems he and his party have created from John in Sutton. Which brings me, kind of, Claire, to mm. my next point. Um, lots of commentators were saying, what a great speech. And I was thinking, yeah, it was a well-delivered speech. We saw a different side of Rishi Sunak. Did and he's we? saying something... Well, I think, actually, we saw... We saw Rishi Sunak. Well, I thought we saw a little... Don't, don't let's go down that red herring. You can't give little. <laughs> oh God, I'm out. I'm going to be called out. I think we saw a little bit more sort of grit for a change. But listen, let's park that okay. because we'll just go down in what is sort of relative trivia. But I kept thinking is, well, he's talking about a new framework. What? As I'm asking our viewers, you know, what is he going to do? How should Sunak put his money where his mouth is? I didn't hear any solutions. I heard no solutions. Yeah. I heard a man who wants to be judged on the right side of history, shall we say. It was a soundbite speech. It was given with the usual um, levity that Rishi Sunak gives when he's, when, he's, when he's discussing things in the Houses of Parliament, for instance. But meanwhile, I think his wife's already phoning up Pickford's to have a quote to see how much it'll be to move out of number 10. I don't think she'd need the quote. <laughs> <laughs> But, there are other operatives. Some people obviously. are saying, look, he just knows games up. I, I don't think prime ministers think like that. I think they will always think. John Major thought until the last day he was going to win in 1997. Uh, I mm -hmm. just don't think prime ministers think like that. Again, I don't have a problem with what he said. But, you know, how would you fix it? How would you fix the fact we've changed <laughs> Parliament's procedures because of threats to MPs? All right, we've had highly divisive and, um, you know, pretty vile behaviour being seen up in Rochdale. Mm -hmm. We've got threats to MPs mm -hmm. at their homes. We mm -hmm. already know of killings that have taken place. But we place. talk about threats. Who is threatening them? Well, uh, his argument is it's Islamic extremists. Well, they need to deal with that. And my issue with that yeah, is... How do you deal with well, it? The I'm a practising Roman Catholic, right? The head of our church is the Pope. And I think that's fundamentally one of the issues with people who are Muslims. They don't have one person that they can go to that gives them the complete guidance and the complete discipline and the complete directives that they actually need mm. to live their lives. So what's their own They're community going to do to exactly, call these people out? Exactly, exactly. I don't know. I really don't know. And we had a report in 2023 from uh, Prevent. I don't know if you're aware of the report. And it focused purely on the right-wing extremists, be, mainly white in this country, yeah. instead of use, instead of looking at the red flag. Uh, this is this is what I felt. Even Rishi Sunak talked about the far right in there as, because it's a catch-all. The problem, the biggest yes. threat to 
Britain at that the moment report is even the security says that it, yes yeah. is the security of this of, nation of, of, from the is, Islamic yes. um, extremists and the radicalisation. Okay? I, I will caveat this because I'm stressing we are talking about extremists. Yes. I don't want anyone to misinterpret what we're talking about here. But, but how it's could now, people it, misinterpret well, that? Well, you, you, they do. Um, trust me, you see my Twitter feed. But the the main point is, isn't it, it Claire? Is that he's called it out. But is it just that? Is it just going to be, I'm going to take away a visa from anyone who's who's misbehaved on the streets or supported Hamas? It's not good enough. Well, it, it, frankly, it wouldn't happen. You'd it, probably find some <clears> lawyers <throat> ready up to defend them and, yeah. and stop them being kicked out. Exactly. I come back to, what can he do? Well, I think he needs to speak to local imams. I think he needs to get them together. And I think he needs to read the Riot Act. Who was it? Who was it? Close down Mo a mosque if it's if it's Who? actually uh, got evidence that yes. it's been it's been yeah absolutely. Yes. Why not? Why not exactly? I, I Why not? I closed down the Church of England if I thought they were preaching hate. Of course. And 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 and, and uh, 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 so forth. It's rules for some and rules for the other, and that and it's othering. You're That's the problem. You're, you're happy to take calls, aren't you? Right? Yes, let's of course go, I Let's am. go to Sarah in West Sussex. Hello, Sarah. Hello, Nick. How are you? I'm very well. All the better because you've called in. What would you like to talk about? <laughs> Um, it's really a comment about um, the speech last night. I mean, obviously, yes. uh, the Prime Minister made a number of points, but um, I think you've just touched on it just now. It's the fact that equivalence was actually given yes. to Islamism and the far right. Yeah. This nebulous far right... Who, who who are they? Well, it's a molehill compared mm. to the mountain that is Islamist yes. um, extremism at the yes. moment. Exactly. And so you can't, if you ask anybody, you know, you can't actually name any of these groups. They might come up with something like the, the EDL, but I mean, even that's disbanded. And I'm not denying that there are not... Yeah, I mean, you know, Nick Griffin is not a savoury character. Uh, no, you know, not just Tommy Robinson. Let, let, let me, or, 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 or Robinson. But we are talking about a significant threat to the safety of this country and mm. now uh, overturning democracy. That's, exactly. that's, that's the point. So I, and I, and absolutely, and I think it, the point was diluted by that type of equivalence mm. because really what he want, what he should have actually said is talked about the elephant in the room. And, and it, because you've got um, uh, the head teacher who's just been to, I think it's the High Court, because a, um, she's stopped all religious prayers and everything else in her... That's in her yes. Yes, yes, that's it. You've got that. You've got the Batley, uh, the teacher from. Well, the I'm going to I'm going to ask you about that because mm -hmm. there is there is a part of me, and I can say this as an a, a older ex-Tory. Quite, you know, I'm not happy about saying this, but the brutal truth is, this sort of extreme behaviour we have seen coming, haven't we? The mm -hmm. Batley teacher, mm -hmm. a teacher mm -hmm. goes into hiding because basically a mob outside the school. Yeah didn't like what he said yeah. i mean that's what it comes mm -hmm. down to yeah. and that's where exactly. we are we've seen this yeah. coming why wasn't action taken then i don't i, I really don't know i mean at the end of the day you get the teaching unions who always advertise saying join us you know if you get a false accusation made we will actually support you there's never they never do that it's all about all kinds of other things which i don't need to go to in at this point but his union has done nothing done absolutely nothing mm. to actually fight his particular corner so i think what rishi needs to do i am so pleased that the government has still yet to adopt the definition of islamophobia which at the end of the day has been defined by the islamists and it and it and they've defined it as a type of racism i mean it's just it's just ludicrous, absolutely ludicrous and the reason that that, that is is like that is because well, I'll speak frankly, they cannot bear the fact that British Jews are a race, anti-Semitism is racism, and it's a criminal offence. They want equivalence with that. Why, why do, you know, Muslims are, not, I'm not saying that all Muslims are Islamists, they're absolutely not. No, and, and, and I'm happy to religion. make that clear, because I think yeah, we do, because we, we just get all misinterpreted, and off it goes we, down a rabbit yeah. hole. And I don't want to do that because I do understand the different distinctions. They they are no more a religion that, than I am as a Christian. But this whole idea is this. I, I mean, I'm, I've been collating over time 
um, anti-Semitic comments on social media, and I send those off to either the campaign against anti-Semitism or to. Well, you the, must be very busy. It's quite shocking. I am it? incredibly busy, and sometimes I've been in tears. It's been so vile. It's been absolutely awful. But I am now finding. Uh, that Sarah, are you right, Jewish? May I ask? No, I'm. No, I'm not. Okay. I have Jewish friends, okay. and I and I do, and I would consider myself. I, I, I do consider myself to be a Zionist. I believe that um, Israel has a has a right to exist and it has a right to self determination. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. from that perspective, and they 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 are always Israel is always held to a much higher standard. It, it is than extraordinary, any other Sarah. The higher yes. standard it is, and I can't yes. think of any other instance where a company a country would have gone through no. October the seventh oh, and gosh. was immediately. Uh, rather not seen as the victim by every uh, by a lot yes. of people. It was an yeah. extraordinary situation. Sarah, for time reasons only, thank you for that no, that's uh, call. Fine. No, that, I, you're, you're welcome. I do, thank you. I do appreciate it and keep on watching and listening. Mm. Um, Claire, anything you want to add to so, that? So, I was just... I remember... Do you remember Rowan Williams when he came out in yes, 2008? Yes, Rowan Williams, yep, yes. And actually said that aspects of Sharia law ought to be embedded in British legislation. Can you imagine? I don't if, remember that. Actually. Yeah. No, can I you don't remember. Can that. you imagine if anything like that had happened? He was talking about divorces um, in the Muslim faith. They should be incorporated into parts of Sharia law. Ought to be incorporated into British legislation. Um, and I think to myself now, thank goodness that wasn't any of that done. Because can you imagine? Mm. We'd have trial by Sharia, trial by. Well, I think that's quite a leap to make. But yes, but no, I, it I, would have gone down that way. Well, I, I again, I would say thin edge, we are thin in. Edge. Well, of course, Thin Edge is relevant, Claire. I get that. But I think there is quite a leap to make that. Uh, listen, um, we got, we got, we're, we're, we're inspiring so much conversation. Excellent. I just have been yelled at in my ear. Let's get Mark <laughs> on from Crew. Mark, hello. Hi. Welcome. I, I, Mark, thank you. Um, I've listened to, to everything that's been said for, for a long time. Well done. I remember September the 11th. Yep. I remember exactly where I was. It's like one of those defining moments of when yes. people of a certain yep. generation knew where Kennedy was. The one thing that is being missed is I, my personal view is, is having lived in Moss Side, which there is a large Islamic and multi-ethnic community, I spent three years living in that community, it's, nobody refers where this radicalism has suddenly come from over the last 30 to 40 years. My, my personal view is, and the one the politicians aren't looking at, is the fundamentalism being financed within the mosques from Saudi Arabia, yeah. but also the yeah. fall of the Shah of Iran. Because when the Shah fell, you then started the trouble with regard to the spread of Islamic fundamentalism. Nobody seems to be dealing with that or looking at the sources of the finance well, for, the, for the mosque. Listen, uh, you make a uh, hugely important point, but it's, and, and, and I don't mean this disrespectfully, the point is it's not new. And, and yet, you know, to the level and extent it's continuing, needs to be challenged, if that is the case. Right, but there's one other, there's one other side that, that, you, that seems to be missed. I was educated in the 1980s at school, we did GC, I did GCS history. You'd not taught the same style of things that have been that we were taught when we were younger. You've taken large chunks. The Conservative government under David Cameron totally changed the way of history. Go on, explain uh, how. Subjects. How? Well, we don't study in depth about the Middle East. <laughs> Well, I don't remember actually studying it in school when I was in... I went to school first in 1968, funny enough. So, listen, a uh, crew... Um, you, you lived Mark, through the Golden Mail years. Uh, well, no, I, yes, I know what I'm living through, but I don't remember studying it in school. Listen, Mark, thank you very much for time reasons only. And Claire is also here. I want to give her a chance to chat. Listen, um, just, just on there, I think mm. we've agreed on one thing. We're not really sure Rishi can do anything or will do anything. Does he uh, want to do anything? Oh, I think he'd love to be able to do something. Well, why I, isn't he? Why are his hands tied? But, but because tied? you and I can't why think of what he, he why, could do. Why Claire? aren't he? But it's not for us. I'm no, not but, getting paid the big bucks. But, but listen, just imagine you were Prime Minister He's for a day. He's still an what MP. Would you do? Surely he should be listening to his constituents. Well, what are his constituents telling him? I'm, I'm, I'm I asking know. the question. I'm asking people how should Sunak put his money where his mouth is? And actually, most people are saying there's nothing he can do. I think under the broad umbrella of there's nothing he can do, people are scared to say what they want to do. And that goes back to your first caller. 
Um, she was Janice, who said, you know, people are frightened to say things now because they'll be bridled, ist or phobic. Yeah, which I think, I think if anything comes out of this, it's a turning point that we are allowed to talk about these things without being shut down. How many professors are shut down at university? How many people are called out for something that they might call on Twitter 10 days ago because the left decides, you know, that they don't meet their agenda, and you're seeing well, careers ruined, lives ruined. Well, a lot of academics are ruined. very, very, very left-wing as well, which well, isn't a good they thing. They are, but those that aren't are literally and pushed out not, of jobs. And they're not. They're not very good at robust discussions about anything because what you'll find is, as you touched on when you did your introduction to your show today, Gen Zers and millennials. How are are they really that resilient? Could they have a proper political scientific debate? I don't think so because they're clouded, their judgments fudged. We, uh, we might talk about that after the break. Keep your calls coming, 0344 499 1000. As you can see, Claire and I are trying to get to them as much as quickly as possible, and I think we will talk about that. Plus, we're also going to talk about this show in London, The Slave, which is saying it is going to have, on a, only a, a certain number of days, uh, BAME audiences only. Now, subsequently, they've said, actually, we won't turn anyone away. And they're doing that because they're basically suggesting that um, people from minority ethnic groups uh, are not are told they're not welcome in the West End. Interesting. Or it's not a safe place for them. Not my words, their words. Isn't that just divisive? 0344 4 double nine one thousand or tweet me at Nick Dubois or WhatsApp 0344 4 double nine one thousand. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yeah. Quite yeah. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <listen. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth blimp. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> ah, a trans... Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> just, 40 yeah. minutes, 40... Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist we're, we're did fail her. Yeah, we're absolutely. supposed to have was moved on from that. Era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth.
I'll be having a debate later between uh, Peter Williams, he's director of the Family Education Trust, and uh, Claire MacDonald, director of My Death, My Solution, about the assisted dying debate that is clearly coming back to Parliament. I can see that that's where this current campaign is going to end. And this um, tweet from Emmy Rose, I'm just going to read it out. Um, Had my dad been allowed to die when he knew there was no hope and was in too much pain, we could have hugged and said our goodbyes. Instead, he had to be drugged asleep with carers cleaning him up until he died, something he told me he hated. I loved that proud man. Emmy, thank you for that. Uh, I can imagine what that's like. That's exactly the family situation we faced, which is why this is going to be, I think, a really interesting debate. Claire, I know you take another view. I do. But actually, uh, not least because of the state of some of the issues in the NHS, but not because of it, the fact of the matter is when the patient has decided not to uh, seek further care, when the doctors accept that decision... Right. We basically end up leaving people to starve to death. Well, that's ridiculous. But that is what it means. Because palliative care is a branch of medicine that um, when you're qualified, you can actually specialise in. More money has to be found for our whole care system. And if we had a proper care system based on respect, care, communication, judgment families, support. But that judgment is the family judgment, Claire. And yes. I know we weren't going to talk about this, but the family judgment is, including the uh, person who's dying, is I want to end this now. Yes. I am not going to have a good lo- a good death. If, if otherwise, uh, give, let me take whatever it is, yeah. do whatever it is. Because yeah. the hospital could not deal with them. There was no ability to go to pa- palliative care at that point. The hospital actually said, we don't know how to do dying well in this hospital. But th- this is my point. We should be able to. We are not Victorian Britain. This is not, this is the 21st century. We, treat, we should be taping, we should be, we treat our dogs and our cats better than we treat our elderly yes, we relatives. Yes, put them out of a misery. Because they're animals, we we're not animals, No, Nick. we may, we, we may, we may understandably regard ourselves better than animals, I understand that. But we also have the ability to differentiate between what is a process that is going to, to inflict happen to pain us all, and suffering. But it Why shouldn't. would we do that? But it shouldn't, because we should have the 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 positions in place to help enable every one of the every one of that mar- of those markers that I read out. Uh, every one of those should be underpinned by a okay. palliative service That's here. A, that- and I would urge people to think of assisted dying not as assisted but it's promoting dying. And okay. all we have to do is look we across will, the pond we, to Canada. No, you've made your point really well, and we're gonna, that's a foretaste of the debate that's going to be coming up later in the show. F- thank you for that, Claire. I did say we would be talking about two other things. So we did, so I, come I, on I think, then. I think we, let, let's do that. Now, um, we're, we're in this situation where uh, we have a play mm-hmm. that is going to be put on in London. That play mm-hmm. uh, is being, going to offer days only where it wants only uh, it actually started talking about black people but BAME groups to yep. come to the theater in the West End for a show where there are they're not under as it said white gays yes yes and and the the reason is their argument is not enough people from ethnic minorities go to the theater yeah I would have thought there's a better way of doing getting more people to the theatre than this. Two things, OK? The thing that's prohibiting people from every single race, creed, religion going to the theatre in the West End is cost, right? That's fundamentally it. Cost cuts through every social strata, every colour you sure, want to be, everything you want to identify. We're not talking about the provinces, we're talking about mm, the West true, End and this true. play. This play that started in Broadway in 2019, mm. that was voted for many Tonys, didn't pick up one. This is, for me, very divisive. They would not get away with it if it was a white theatre company um, putting on promoting a white play and wanting only a white um, audience without the black gaze. Well, if we're to test it, and I'm actually on the deliberately trying to put some points to you, if we're to test it, uh, we have... Um, I, I think it's well to say uh, that the population, for example, of uh, the UK, it's something like 81% white, mm-hmm. 19% from other ethnicities. Mm-hmm. Actually, in employment in mm-hmm. the theatre, 
uh, I, I think it's 20% people from mm -hmm. uh, black and minority ethnic groups are employed there. They get more money. Um, those same groups that are funding uh, 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 are funded. recognized well from the Arts Council. Yep. They're giving out a higher share of money. Yep. There are things that are going on to help promote um, uh, I'm quite theater sure there to people. Are. But if that hasn't worked, I guess my question is, is there any harm no, in trying you see, this? You see, I don't think this is anything to do with getting more, I think it's more to do with racially actually. diverse. It is com it's a completely and utterly publicity stunt. That's exactly what it is. Kit Harrington is taking the lead of the He's plantation. He's some famous actor, isn't he? He is. He yeah, was in Game yeah. of Thrones. I've not actually seen no, an episode no, of. No. However, he plays the male lead, um, who is a plantation owner. Mm -hmm. It's about slavery. It's penned on um, sexual um, sexual advances, slavery, sexual abuse. And the connotation is um, slavery. And a lot of black people will be absolutely... Uh, Spurred by um, and 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 actioned by the word slavery, it's very you know it's yeah. it's very very hugely, harsh. And if we want thing. to, especially if we want to open up discussions about this, quite rightly, I think there's other ways to do it. You cannot the thing is, ban. It's, not, it's hardly inclusive. Is you it? can't you can't you can't promote a theatre of one night to be filled with with um, BAME or even that the the producers have actually said or people who identify as black. I've never heard anything yeah, as ridiculous I, in my I'm life. Gonna, I'm gonna Nick, put the I identify that. as no, a no. size 10. <laughs> it's indefensible. You can't <laughs> Don't defend... Don't draw me down that You road. can't defend it. But, but, but I'm... Well, I'm, I'm trying to because to make discussion lively and I've read what they've said. So what they're saying there, this is not about a white person going in who says, I identify black. <laughs> it's people who... But you who, can. Who, uh, and they also sure say no one will be turned away. Well, no one will, no be, one will be turned away. away because they need the money. Well, no one will be turned that away. That trumps their... possibly for money but also um, uh, they were they were also implying why would a, a white person want to come and sit with a night that's for all black people in the theatre who I cares mean, well, I exactly, don't, ca I that, don't care what someone looks inclusivity like about exactly mixing working living and sharing together, together you know that's what I find so bizarre so the, the, the question, this is West End, there's probably yeah. no public money going into this that I'm aware of. Uh, I wouldn't have thought so that's going into it. Other people... Um, uh, well, there uh, will be somewhere along, along the line. It'll be the public it, person that will be doing it. 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 it it's, it's quite possible. But has have, are you aware of where this may have been tried before? Because, it was in Broadway. Yeah, well, no, not this play. This right. was also tried, uh, this idea was tried at the Stratford Theatre Royal. Now, uh, and it went off without any comment. Let me just explain to people the Stratford Theatre Royal was founded Did Russell Quirk not buy the whole... Oh he may have done now but it was founded because the idea was and I think it was really patronising in the way it was presented mm. was that back in the 50s I think it was Joan Littlewood Theatre mm -hmm, it was known mm -hmm. as was the idea you would take theatre to the working classes and plonk it in the That's why the it's citizens a little patronizing. That's why the this. Citizens Theatre in Glasgow existed and exists to this day. It was set up okay. near Trongate for the working people to bring theatre to them. And I'll tell you, I watched Rupert Everett play there in the picture of Dorian Gray when he was just starting yes, out. Yes. Because that theatre made him ironically. Okay, so it does work. Bit of a thumbs down from here. I tried to put up a defence. What do you it's think indefensible. about this? Well, I've got to try, haven't I? You see, I'm not necessarily. I'm not necessarily going to go to the, go over the trenches for this one. <laughs> I think you can say o three four 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 double nine one thousand. Some of you are coming in with your views. I'm going to read a few more messages just before we touch on uh, another subject on that. Or um, actually, before I do that, let's go to Peter in Oxfordshire. Yes, Peter. Hello, Nick. Gosh, I'm um, all over the place today. Excellent <laughs> program, as always. Thank you very, um, very much. We are inundated with calls, Peter. So far away. Yeah, the the problem goes back to the beginnings. Let, let's just start. In, in Which the problem 1980s, are we talking about here, Salman Peter? Rushdie, I'm talking about Islamophobia. Okay. Um, in the 1980s, when Salman Rushdie was subjected to a fatwa by an old man in Iran, who yes. never even read yeah. his book. Ayatollah Khomeini, was it, or was it another one? Everybody condemned it. Yeah. How did we get from there to Batley, where a school teacher is teaching exactly. and a mob goes outside and nobody raises a word of criticism? Not the Labour MP, not the Muslim authorities, not the police, and the guy has to go, and the, and the teaching unions, and nobody does anything to protect that guy. Isn't that fear, though? 
This what's fear happened, of yeah, offence. What's happened in the meantime yeah. is we've had this definition of Islamophobia from the, the parliamentary group. I don't think it's been adopted by every party, though, has no, it? No, it's a, it's a rubbish definition, um, an attack on Muslimness. It, in effect, it's introducing blasphemy by the back door. We don't have Hindu phobia, we don't have Buddhist phobia, we don't have Christophobia. Religion is something that is open to attack just the same as anything else. That's the point. But somehow the Muslims have a protected status. Why do they have a protected status? Because everybody is in fear. That goes back to your point. The point that the Prime Minister made, people are in fear. And that fear has got to stop. Because if he don't, how? It, it's going to get worse. How? Well, that's How? the problem I don't think anyone can answer. I don't mean that rudely. I'm struggling no, no. myself. I think, your guest, I think your guest put a finger on it when she said, you know, Catholics go to the Pope. We should be going to the senior authorities and Muslims and saying, look, we're on the side of moderate Muslims. We support moderate Muslims. We like them. We want them in our country. But we want these extremists rooted out. You must preach in the mosques. Mm -hmm. You must give guidance and teaching to, the, to your people to outline these people. And they are afraid. They are afraid because a moderate Muslim cleric in Egypt was murdered by extremists. They know what these extremists can do. So they have to be protected. But they are the people who give the lead. And they are not giving the lead at the moment in the way that they should okay. because they Peter? are using this Islamophobic definition in order to parry off criticism. Peter, you very powerfully put your uh, point mm. across. I'm going to let Claire come back to you on that. Thank you for your call. We'll be coming up to the top of the hour and we're going to continue our conversation on the state of UK politics and I'll have guest Neil Parrish, former Conservative MP and of course Sir Vince Cable. Claire, um, a praise from our listener there apart from anything else? Well, absolutely and Peter, thanks for watching and thanks for listening and I think, you know, he's right and I think many people will be right because it's an... Uh, a fact that's often overlooked, it really is. Who knows what imams are teaching in mosques? Not only do they have the, the, the sex segregation in them, um, but also the infantilization of, of communications, the, 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 the misogynistic way of the religion in parts, the way that they, you know, the, and the radicalization mm -hmm. of young boys in particular. Yeah. It's really really crucial we, we get to the the the, the nuts but and programs bolts of this. like prevent are they actually any good well it's highlighted this but it seems to be overlooked because we're now third month into 2024 this report came out last year yeah. come on but but prevent's been around for years and it drew a lot of criticism for actually not achieving anything as it and, and you could argue by the f simple fact we still have the problem we have today that people have been radicalized yes but also the report did highlight they're looking in the wrong direction mm. 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 Even though, I mean, look, it, it is true that in some countries there's been a threat, there's been killings as yeah. a result of the far right. But yeah. it, is not, it is not the problem we are facing No, and I think, here. going back to Lindsay Hoyle, for, um, Sir Lindsay Hoyle halting... Who changed parliamentary procedure. I think that was wrong. Yeah, exactly. I really because, do. I think that was fundamentally wrong. Because he was worried wrong. about MPs being threatened. Well, that, that's up to the police, mm. Mm. to police and govern the mm. law. And protect. Yeah, of course it is. Yeah, not Parliament. It's, no, it's not just Parliament are there for us. He was bullied, basically. He was, yeah, he uh, absolutely was by Keir Starmer. Well, that 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 is, he would say not, but in a way he was I would bullied. Say he no, was. I would say he was bullied because of this culture of threats and fear against MPs. He will argue he was acting out of the are interest you trying, of MPs, uh, but, you, but uh, effectively you know, it's a bullying that's the, going the on awful, by extremism. The awful uh, murder of David M. Amos, the awful murder yeah, and absolutely. attack of Joe Cox. Mm. I'm, you cannot legislate for evil. You cannot legislate against that not happening again because there are a bunch Joe of... Joe Cox, of course, was not killed by an Islamic extremist. That's, I don't care if she was no, still no, killed. No, no, I know. I know that's the point I, I'm I making. I think it's right to point that out. No, you can't legislate from that, but this is different. This is a different plane because basically so many MPs are being threatened it's changed parliamentary procedure because he made the wrong decision yes, I agree with yes. you but that's how substantive the threat to our democracy is this is this is extremism in a very very sinister fashion I think society needs to get a grip I think society needs to move forward I think we have to have more cohesion I think we have to stop the disparate political sniding I mean parliament's a cesspit 
It's like watching Love Island or Celebrity Big Brother on speed. It's ridiculous. Mm -hmm. It's certainly not fi fighting for my rights. Mm -hmm. It's not grown-up discussion. Mm -hmm. It's like a pantomime. Mm -hmm. okay, and it's disgusting. Well our parliament, you know, I think it's the best parliamentary system in the world, but unfortunately at the moment, uh, many of you will have a different view, but that may be just because of the actions of this last parliament. And that doesn't mean the system is wrong, by the way. Yeah, uh, no, true. Listen, um, fantastic to have you, Claire Muldoon. Thank, Thank you, you very, very much. much for joining us. We've it's had been lots my of pleasure. calls. Spirited lots of calls. I'm afraid, Joshua in Colchester, I'll come to you after the hour. I promise you, we'll call you back. I couldn't quite fit you in on this time. I do feel like we've got so much going on. <laughs> Here. I need to. I need. I need a pilot's license to be able to do this. Coming up, Neil Parish, former Conservative MP, and Sir Vince Cable will be joining me. Former leader of Liberal Democrats. Why? Because we'll be talking about the state of Parliament. And don't forget, I'll also be having that live debate on assisted suicide. Stay with us. This is Talk TV. This, my friends, is Talk Today with me, Jeremy Kyle. And me, Nicola Thorpe. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. Now, you ain't going to ab and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of Cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, a trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right too. Yay. Quite Yay. right too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. You might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia, reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on what <laughs> just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <miss him. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I know it's I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, <laughs> a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> just, 40 yeah. minutes, 40... Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, 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 what did fail her. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Era. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Just when I was getting used to my show, What Just Happened, being on Talk TV every Friday night at 10.30, they go and change it. I'm furious. They've moved it to 8.30 every Friday. Talk TV, What Just Happened. I am furious.
And welcome back. It's a privilege to have your company. As I said, I always invite you to call and we'll talk about anything you like, but goodness me, you really are calling today and I'm hugely appreciative of it. Uh, I've always said I feel politicians should listen more and more uh, to talk radio. They do get a, a sense of, of what's going on. And we'll be talking to two very shortly. Let me just read uh, a couple of messages that have come out. Uh, and I've been essentially asking you... Uh, Rishi Sunak, look, we know what he thinks from his speech last night, but I'm absolutely clueless as to what he's going to do. And some of you have responded. I've said, you know, where does he, how does he put his money where his mouth is? You said it's too late for Sunak to deal with things now, says Barry. He and the rest of our MP should never have let it get so bad in the first place. Ridiculous. I'm talking, of course, about the threat to our democracy. Uh, some of you have been uh, blunter than that. We've told every government that we did not want mass immigration, and yet they ignored us. The people who should get the least protection are the MPs. Let them enjoy cultural enrichment first, says Adam. Adam, we can never be in a position where we think it's OK to uh, have people uh, threatened or, or attacked even, and we've seen that in the worst cases. Uh, your point stands, of course, where you feel you've been not listened to uh, by uh, mem MPs, and you may even include me as one of those from the past. But I suppose I'm, I'm quite. We're going to talk now, of course, about politics and the state of politics. Um, in some senses, post the by-election and, and post Rishi Sunak's uh, Rishi Sunak's speech. And I'm very pleased to say um, I'm joined, first of all, by former leader of the Liberal Democrats, Vince Cable. Welcome, Sir Vince. Good to hear, have you on the show. Afternoon, um, Vince. Uh, I suppose my first question to you is: Do do you feel um, a, a level of support for for Rishi Sunak coming out and, if you like, articulating what he sees? I think as a legitimate threat to our democracy, uh, and his his effectively is a call for a you for us to come together in a unity. Well, I think that's a you know very admirable sentiment. I mean, I've always been in favour of sort of consensual, compromising, middle of the road politics myself. This is where I finished up. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I think there's also a danger of exaggerating the problem. I mean, we we must take very very seriously threats of violence to individuals, whether they're MPs or other people. But I, I think some of the storm around demonstrations, calling them riots. I mean, I'm a veteran of Vietnam marches and Iraq marches, which are much bigger and in some ways more robust than the demonstration we've seen recently. So I think we've got to compartmentalise the issues a little bit. Um, uh, listen, I'm also very pleased to say we've now got on the line uh, 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 Neil Parrish, former Conservative MP. Uh, thanks for bearing with us technology-wise and welcome, Neil. Um, I, I hope you heard uh, the remarks there from Sir Vince and he was sort of reminding us of some of the uh, demonstrations that took place under Vietnam. But in a way, what we've seen at demonstrations here is more insidious, isn't it? Uh, for example, the projection uh, uh, onto the Houses of Parliament of from that, that slogan, uh, from the river to the sea. I mean, do you, can, are you behind Rishi Sunak's, uh, if you like, comments and thoughts that he made yesterday? And if so, though, I'd ask you the same question I'm asking our viewers. What can he actually do to reduce this threat to democracy? Yeah, thank you, Nick, and thank you very much for inviting me on. Um, I think there is a real problem at the moment. Um, I, I agree with Sir Vince, you don't want to sort of over-egg it. But on the other hand, you know, once you say you're basically going to drive um, Israel into the sea, then, you know, you cannot make those remarks. Now, I can understand how upset everybody is. I mean, I'm a supporter of Israel, but I do not support what they're doing now in Gaza. So, you know, I think the whole world is beginning to say um, it needs to be sorted. But I think, you know, in this country, um, we don't really want I mean, MPs, you know, we're fairly robust people. We've got to stand up, to, you know, to quite a lot of things. But I think once they start targeting people's houses um, and so on and so forth, I think, I think it comes too much. And I think what Rishi Sunak can do um, is actually give the powers 
uh, powers to the police to be able to intervene if these marches and, and if these sort of stakeouts around uh, people's houses uh, go too far. Because I think in the end, um, we do need to be able to have free speech. But of course, in order to have free speech, uh, you, you have to be able to, whatever side you're on, you have to be able to make that point freely um, without actually being intimidated. And I think this is the problem. And of course, the Jewish community naturally feel very intimidated by what's going on in the country at the moment uh, and the whole thing you know and then you've got you know George Galloway uh, winning the by-election due to, to to really problems with the, the Labour candidate mm. um, and the Labour candidate more or less sort of not being supported well, so all of this is highlighting division because don't forget mm. Galloway will most MPs come in and I think Sir Vince would agree with me with this you try to look after everybody once you become an MP but you see, George Galloway doesn't work like that. He works in a very divisive way. We'll, we'll come to um, uh, uh, Galloway in a moment, if I may. So, Vince, uh, picking up on what Neil Parrish said there, uh, is it a case of actually needing new powers for the police to deal with some of the incidents we've seen? Or is it a case, as Rishi Sunak pointed out, he's, he actually had to appeal to the police because we have this tradition politicians don't, if you like decide who to be arrested and not, but he basically appealed to them not to just manage the demonstration, but police the demonstration. Do you think the police are actually failing in their duty by letting some of these incidents we've been talking about take place? I think in general, the police, you know, we're lucky. Our police are very professional. Um, I mean, there are times in the past when, you know, I've wanted to, to have more active intervention to stop um, aggressive marching. I mean, I remember the days of the National Front, for example, who, you know, would shout out slogans which are just as offensive as some of the marches today. Um, but the view of the authorities and the police was that in free society, it's much better that we allow them to march than that we don't. And I, I think that's right. I mean, we're, you know, we're seeing, you know, in Russia, you know, the Navalny demonstrations, the reports coming in from Iran, you know, these are countries which do suppress demonstrations. Um, and one of the, the joys of the UK is that we we allow it. And, and the, the, the police, I think, understand that. Um, they're, they don't, they're not lacking in powers at all. Well, I mean, they're, they're, OK, but you see, in a way, I, I, I say this very respectfully, I think you're ducking the point I'm making there because I wouldn't want to ban demonstrations but people who break the law and project onto parliament what is a deeply it's it's not just offensive it's it's they're putting a slogan that Hamas an illegal organization the terrorist deemed organization are using their founding charter we have people actually at the demonstrations chanting these anti-Semitic slogans and actually support for Hamas. They should get in and arrest them, shouldn't they? Well, the, the, the issue about the hologram, uh, I mean, obviously required some fairly sophisticated technology and people who knew what they're doing, and it should be possible, I would have thought, for the authorities to track them down and charge them. Um, I mean, the, the central point is that the police have adequate powers. They've probably got too much powers. I mean, you may remember... Um, a year or so ago, legislation went through Parliament, um, you know, creating an offence about shouting and, and, and very minor nuisance. And, you know, too there are too many powers. I mean, there, there are very strong public order offences. There are uh, powers to arrest people who are inciting hatred. And if people are inciting hatred through anti-Semitic slogans, then, then arrests are, are appropriate. Um, you know, we, we've had much more violent and much bigger demonstrations in the past. Uh, you may remember the anti-globalization protests uh, 15 years ago, something of that order. Um, I remember when my party leader was being hung in equity in, in Parliament Square. I don't think anybody suggested that the police should rush in and arrest the students who are responsible. I mean, you know, within the democracy, uh, we have to allow the freedom of protest. But that does sound like you are supporting oh. the idea you can support Hamas in this demonstration, uh, just not, to be clear. Not, not, nothing but contempt for that organisation. Okay. All right, we that's are... fair enough. OK, so I'm glad, uh, I'm glad you cleared that up. But could I perhaps ask um, Sir Vince? Um, sorry, could I ask uh, Neil? Neil, uh, the, the, the Conservatives have, be, have, have been in office for a, an awful long time, 14 years now. I shouldn't have used the word awful. That'll be misinterpreted. But for a long for a long time. And for Rishi Sunak to come out now 
and flag this problem as he sees it of a threat to democracy. Isn't there part of you that thinks a failure to stand up in the past when teachers, for example, at Batley School are going into hiding because they have offended one religious group, in this case, a uh, Muslim groups. I mean, that's at the point we should have started talking about extremist Islamic behaviour and how to tackle it. Not now, surely. Yes, I mean, I think that the trouble is, Nick, that, that we've always had a sort of a lightness of touch with policing, a lightness of touch with actually intervening. Uh, and I think we do actually need to be a lot tougher. And, and, and probably you can argue um, the Prime Minister should have been tougher sooner. Uh, but it is very difficult, much of this. Um, and of course, you know, you cannot, like I said, have uh, a terrorist organisation being supported that is hugely against um, the Jewish population, not only of this country, but of course uh, Israel itself. So, so I think you know, I think he was right to come out now. I, I think we do need to get tougher. But of course, where I do um, agree with Sir Vince Cable um, is that. Look, on the whole, uh, over the years, we've got away in this country with a likeness of policing on demonstration, which largely has worked. But of course, what we are now facing uh, is something quite different and it's quite big. And of course, I mean, if we could actually achieve um, a ceasefire in, in, in Gaza and, and Israel can stop its bombardment, then I think a lot of the pressure here will, will ease. So a lot of what we can do in some ways um, is far more trying to settle uh, what's happening um, okay. um, well in the Middle East than it is really you're, on you're, you're right, that is an obviously important issue. But let me ask you this before I, I go back to Sir Vince, if I may. One final question for you. Many people on this station are saying uh, multiculturalism has failed and his speech last night demonstrated that from Rishi Sunak. Uh, Neil Parrish, do you agree with that? No, because I, I spent um, I spent 10 years in, in the European Parliament. Um, and I tell you what, I saw sort of through France and Germany and other of the major European countries, um, much less multiculturalism. Um, I actually think this country has largely been successful. We are going through now a, a huge problem period and we need to sort it. But I am not one that says we have completely broken down because I think we, you know, we are... I actually believe that the cultures and, and the races and the people that have come into this country over, you know, hundreds of years actually make this country the diverse culture that it's got and, and provides, you know, an awful lot both to our language and to everything that we, we believe in. And so I think let's not throw the baby out with the bathwater. Um, I think, yes, we've got big problems and, yes, we need to sort them. Uh, but are we are falling apart? No, I don't think we are. But I think we need to take it very, very uh, seriously. Uh, uh, so, so Vince, let, let, me address that, uh, let me address the same question to you. When you have consistently thousands of people who are essentially uh, a de demonstrating a contempt uh, for, free, for, for free speech uh, in the sense that they will abuse it to supporting terrorist organisations. Do you not feel that uh, multiculturalism is at least teetering, if not failed? Well, there are two totally different issues there. I mean, you know, first of all, as far as the demonstrations, the vast majority of the people who are protesting are not remotely sympathetic to terrorism. They're just expressing a very strong point of view about the Gaza conflict. But shouldn't they leave if they're walking I, alongside people? Experience. If there yeah, were... I mean, I, I've been on demonstration in the past. And I mentioned Vietnam and Iraq, and there would be a handful of kind of extreme, you know, Trotskyites or whatever who were completely out of sync with the rest of the marchers. And, and um, you know, we're getting the same phenomenon here. And some of them are unpleasant. If they break the law, they should be arrested. But they, you shouldn't stigmatize all the marchers because of that. On the wider issue of multiculturalism or multiracialism, uh, actually, Britain is a big success story compared with the United States, compared with France. I mean, the diversity of the cabinet is a very good advertisement for it. I mean, we, we I came to this country from, I've been living in Africa in the mid-60s, 
I came back, I had a multiracial family. There was a lot of hate. There was a lot of real intolerance and extreme fear in this country in the late 60s. You may remember the Rivers of Blood speeches. I have to say that Britain today is immeasurably better. But can, we, can we can we be can we be and by the way i take your point I, I take your point sorry to interrupt you there but i take your point it's important to say this that no one's brandishing either all the marchers or all uh, uh all muslims in the same category as extremists uh, islamic extremists by any means but when you have a by election in this country that is fought on gaza and is won on gaza i mean what does that say about multiculturalism or what does it say about our politics i think we've had by election in the past fought on the iraq war and, and other issues that were but that was direct good. british involvement and whether we should be there or not yes well uh, mr galloway as, as you know is a, is a jekyll and hyde character but he his victory can't simply be explained by by gaza i mean he had a very big majority if it had simply been uh, you know a militant group of from the local islamic community he wouldn't have come anywhere near that kind of majority there was a wider disaffection with the major parties um including mine um, and he capitalised on it, and he's a you know he's got a brilliant organiser, very eloquent, despite being very unpleasant in many ways. But I think attributing this uh, Rochdale by-election simply to the, the all his literature was Gaza. It was all Gaza, and then he had some smaller sections that were devoted to local issues. I mean, goodness sake, it, it was like a Gaza rally at some of his debates. Sure. Well, he'd, he'd won before in Bethnal Green. He'd mm. won before in Bradford. It's not... Okay. This is new. I mean, the, the, there are um, issues and there are pockets within our country, small pockets, where politicians like Galloway can operate. I mean, as it happens, so, he, so, he started so, in Glasgow and he stood in the same constituency indeed, I did. Indeed. Indeed. Very good. So, so I'm sorry, for time reasons only, so, so Vince Cable, thank you very much, former leader of the Liberal Democrats, for joining us, and Neil Parrish, former Conservative MP, thank you both uh, very much for joining me this afternoon on this subject. I've got time for a very, very quick call from Joshua um, in Colchester. Joshua, I'm sorry to keep you waiting, but I didn't want to stop that discussion. Uh, would you like to add to it? Yes, uh, thank you. Um, uh, what I want to add to it is the word Islamophobia. Yes. Okay. Um, so we see that the word Islamophobia is now coming into the lexicon. And I want, um, I think it's a dangerous path for Britain to tread because, uh, why do I say that? Because once you we open that Pandora box, we are going to have African phobia, Christian phobia, anything that has got a noun will have a phobia attached to it and then which shuts it, down speech and criticism it doesn't shut it down speech it shut down debate we are fear now maybe let me add this you see this word is a is is a synonym for blasphemy so yeah, as soon as we embrace it whichever way we operationalize it and i know british is a tolerant society we are introducing blasphemy into our society and this is fear at the moment many people are well isn't are it how you re react to blasphemy i remember monty python you may not even remember them they were absolutely castigated for blasphemy by the church of england when they had uh, yeah. life of brian but there was not extremism going out and and actually attacking them as far as i'm aware yeah. yes yes but this is real this is real you see because Islam, Islam and, and uh, is Islamic fundamental, we know where they operate and we know how the, 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 uh, the laws of blasphemy operate in those places and the punishment that are attached to this. But this is Britain. This is 21st century Britain. So to contemplate or to even think about it, that we live in Britain and we are, we are scared to, to discuss something. See, anybody can discuss anything about... Well, Joshua, society. you hit the nail on the head. We should not be frightened to discuss. And I, this goes to my opening thesis that we've allowed for years conversation and challenge to be shut down uh, in the early days simply because it didn't um, uh, because it offended the the uh, loud voices on the left that was yes. ridiculous and it's led to many of the problems we have today they're not directly linked but you can follow a train Joshua thank you very much indeed for calling me I'm sorry to cut you off there but that was me overrunning coming up next your mental health in decline 
generations, however, differ on the causes of the apparent crisis this survey finds. I'm going to be joined by Dr Amanda Gummer, child psychologist, to discuss this subject and our various reactions to the growing problem of mental health. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman is not a woman. Trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right too. Yeah. Quite yeah. right too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <listen. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth blimp. Mr Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> ah, a trans... Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> just, 40 yeah. minutes, 40... Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist we're, we're did fail her. Yeah, we're absolutely. supposed to have was moved on from that. Era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. And welcome back. Uh, lots of messages coming in. Quite a few. Not um, not entirely convinced by Vince Cable or Neil Parrish there. I will uh, read some of those. Uh, here's one from Stuart. With respect, those guests, one Tory and Vince Cable, Liberal Democrat, demonstrate perfectly the political disconnect between politicians and the people. And there's more on that vein. Nick, Vince Cable is complacent to the extent of being oblivious to very serious threat to Britain from Islamic extremism. I must admit, there was a touch of this, everything's fine. Um, now, I'm oversimplifying, but that isn't, I don't think, what you wanted to hear or necessarily what I wanted to hear. But that's why we have guests on this show, to get other points of view and get you talking, which you are certainly doing. Keep those calls coming, 03444 99 1000. Now, <laughs> I'm going to talk about this subject because I know it divides opinion, but basically... We've got a situation where, uh, as, as I was saying just before the break, um, mental health is in decline, or certainly we are uh, seeing more and more people uh, being treated or um, uh, for, for mental health. It's interesting in the survey that was published yesterday, I think it was on the 23rd, uh, or very, very recently, about generations and how we differ in our view on the causes of this uh, crisis, if you wish to 
define it as that. And this was found from a survey. So baby boomers, for example, are much more likely to put youth mental health problems, and that's fundamentally what I want to talk about, down to greater use of drugs and alcohol. And I kind of get that. The one thing that was pretty consistent across all groups, if I've read it properly, is the impact of social media. And I totally, I, I just have no doubt about that whatsoever. And I was also um, intrigued by this subject because I read of a school that, according to this tabloid headline, sparks a row by making false eyelashes part of its uniform amid peer pressure from pupils, uh, which was slammed by parents. And this, we are told, was because um, it was uh, affecting their mental health and this would make them feel better. So you kind of got two ends of the spectrum there. To help me navigate this, I'm very pleased to welcome Dr Amanda Gummer. She's a child psychologist, founder of goodplayguide.com. Welcome. Thank you for joining me. I, I suppose we shouldn't be surprised that everyone from my generation of the baby booners down to whatever the other one is Gen Z, Gen X, I get totally lost on it. Um, we have different views about mental health and the causes, don't we? But can I first challenge you on the point of agreement? Most people think social media has a big part to play in it. Is that fair? I think it's absolutely fair. And I don't think it's social media per se. I think it's the um, premature access to social media that is, is going on. Social media... There's a, a campaign to raise the age for access to social media to 16, which I don't think would be a bad idea. But it's currently at 13, and we know that there are six, seven, eight-year-olds yeah. accessing that, social media. That's the reality. Media. They're going and to. That's aren't they? where the problem is. Yeah, I think having teenagers being able to connect, and there's a lot of positives around social media, but having them able to connect and being able to develop the skills needed to navigate the social media space is really important. You can't do that when you're seven or eight. But um. In all honesty, um, Amanda, can you see any prospect of successful regulation of social media to stop kids going to it? Because if the parents are not going to enforce it, and it's pretty hard to enforce, how on earth can we achieve it? Yeah, and this is something that keeps me up at night. This is, you know, we need the tech giants to get more responsible. We do need parents to be better informed and educated. But it's very difficult for parents to keep up with the rate of change. You know, they master Facebook and then kids move to Instagram. They master Instagram, they move to Snapchat. They're just getting the head around Snapchat and then it's Be Real and TikTok and yep. Twitch I, and all I know about things. half so, of those only. So, so, yeah, and I think so, I'm tech savvy. Yeah. So the, the pace of change is really difficult to keep up with. And I think it's it's unfair for us to bash the parents. I think there are some general parenting is the general parenting advice of, you know, keeping channels of communication open, not letting kids take devices to bed, making sure that you know who they're talking to in the same way that you know who their friends are in real life, you know, get involved in their digital digital world. That's all really good advice. But I think it has to come from the tech giants. They have to take responsibility so, for this. So, so let's let's look at the, the um, not necessarily the generational differences of what's causing it, uh, but... But the rise of mental health, how much of that is actually, and uh, if, I, if I explain this ignorantly, just, just be tolerant of me, how much of that is kind of new or how much of it has always existed? But my generation, we were told just to, you know, get on with it and, and stop whining or whatever it may be. Do you, do you understand the scale? Because I'm trying to understand yeah. what, how we've got this boom in it. Apart from COVID and our determination to lock youngsters down and deprive them of social sort of uh, behaviours they would normally have, I'm struggling to understand why it's all suddenly such a big issue. So it's a complex um, scenario, it's a complex issue. Um, and I think there are several things. So the first one, is that we are overprotecting our children in the real world. We're not letting them go out. We're not letting them have those social environments. They are spending more time online and more isolated. And human connection, human interaction, things like learning to risk assess, you know, learning your own boundaries, exploring the world around you, connecting with your community, that is all really important in building that social network and that agency, giving kids agency that is a real buffer against mental health. So there's, there's the 
sort of closure of childhood. We're, we're not letting kids go out and play in the same but way. But isn't that, that a parental to. thing? Because you were saying be kind to parents, which I, I get it, we should be kind to everyone. But how much is it the parents should say, right, I'm disconnecting you, get out and go and mix with real people? Simple, I Absolutely. Know. But we need, but th so there's a bigger picture there as well. We have, um, the, the investment in children's play spaces, playgrounds outside, you know, there was a big investment in the early 2000s and all of those playgrounds are being left to rack and ruin now because councils are going bust and that's not a priority for them. So the safe community-based play spaces where parents felt good about letting their kids go and play, they're going into disrepair. So we haven't got communities that are facilitating children going out and playing. There is also increased traffic and cars are being made safer for the drivers. So parents' fears around traffic are absolutely valid and we need to make sure that children are able to move around their communities much more safely and, and freely. Um, and if we can do that, then yes, absolutely, then let's educate parents about the benefits of that. But when, you, when we are not, as a society, providing accessible play spaces for our children and we're also, you know, prioritising drivers over kids, we, so, we, I think okay. parents aren't the right so, people to be laying the blame. So out. would I be called, um, and, and you'd never be this rude, I'm sure, but would would I just be called a reactionary old fuddy-duddy if I said, do you know what, when I was a kid, there were hardly any play areas. We just got out there, we kicked a ball around in the street, if it was relatively safe. Uh, you know, we'd go running in farm fields and, and we just got on. Uh, why does it need the state to provide something to help kids avoid mental health issues? Um, by providing play areas and things. That's what I'm struggling to get my head around. So if you are lucky enough to live where you can run in fields and play in woods and, and have that freedom, then absolutely that's great. That is a minority of the client, of the of the population is these it, days. Is it really? We are in, yeah, we're increasingly cityfied, aren't we? There is kids growing up in tower blocks in the middle of cities yeah, definitely it's with happening. no space. But is it a minority uh, that yeah. live, live outside of cities and, and town developments? Yeah, that can that can safely walk to a field or a wood. Yeah, absolutely, it's a minority. So would you draw a correlation between mental health being worse with city kids or even large town kids than village and small town kids? I, I'm, I, I'm, haven't, a... I, yeah, I haven't seen any data on that specifically, okay. but it would not surprise me at all. OK, OK. Perhaps I could ask you, you know, don't get cross with me for asking this because I accept it's a tabloid report, but, but I'm... I think these are things that are just worth addressing one way or the other. This this school row, uh, where uh, basically the head teacher has said the decision to basically allow false making false eyelashes as part of its uniform, right, um, has happened because students were missing school to have their lashes removed and refusing to attend without them, and that actually if you like, loosening the boundaries was preserving their mental health and well-being. I mean, is that really sort of, shouldn't discipline and boundaries, wouldn't that actually help mental health and well-being? Yeah, boundaries, kids need to know where they stand and clear boundaries consistently and force are absolutely part of helping children understand how to behave in a, in a society, in a, in a sort of healthy society. Um, yeah, I haven't got the details of that particular no, school sure. and that particular policy, but I, it doesn't sound like a, something that I would think is a good idea, I have to say. Do you think, because um, you look a far lot younger than me, a lot, lot younger than me. Thank you. Um, <laughs> well, well, it's true. Um, that, that actually we should start delving into um, we, in mental health and looking at family causes rather than, than, than perhaps just um, uh, putting it down to, to social media and other things, because definitely families have changed. Dysfunctional families are more on the increase. Um, but, you know, when you read that things are happening, for example, w when kids are going to school at the age of four and only one in four is actually trained how to use the toilet, you start to question, do, you know, what is parenting like? Has it changed sufficiently? And is there a direct link to mental health uh, issues with youngsters? So I think, again, it's a complex issue. I think COVID has had a massive impact, in, in impact on children who are now sort of starting school because for two years those kids didn't socialise, they didn't go out and, and see friends. So there weren't the sort of natural developmental milestones that kids were sort of compared against each other, it, everything was kept in a very sort of um, small bubble. 
but equally you know society's changed we don't live around the corner from granny and across the road from our sister or down the road from our aunt and uncle you don't Very have true. that support network and there is a lot of pressure on parents who are often two working parents on their own without a support network because they've had to move for a job or whatever and they're just being that you know parents are doing the best they can and i think it is important that as a society we recognize that and give them the tools to help support them rather than just giving them giving them another stick to beat themselves with i think you know parents do need to make sure that they are understanding the risks and benefits or cost benefit analysis of the decisions they make around their children things like not walking to school and not being able not letting their children play more socially and, and sort of keeping them wrapped up in cotton wool. Amanda, I think that's a, a really, really important thing that you said just at the end there, if you like that. And parents need to understand, maybe that is part of it, because that is also going to have a major influence on a youngster's life, I'm sure. Dr Amanda Gummer, thank you so much for joining me. Child psychologist, founder of goodplayguide.com. I did, I did not get to ask her the one question I wanted to, although I think this applies not really to youngsters, is I heard someone remark, has mental health? become the new back pain because that's something I think I'll explore where the workplace is at a future at a future show and I asked the question I'm not stating it as fact let's uh we just got time to go to Sarah in Birmingham Sarah hello hello Th thank you for joining me what would you like to talk about um, just going back to and you were talking about Islamophobia and all the things that are going on in the current media with regards to Gaza and Palestine yes um, the three words I'd like to use disappointed disillusioned and heartbroken um, okay. In the sense that I'm, I'm, I was born in this country. My parents came over in the 60s, worked damn hard. Yep. When they came over, it made a difference to the country because obviously um, after various things, you needed the Commonwealth to come and help you to rebuild the UK. Yes, very Zimbabwe, much in the 60s and 50s. That was yeah, absolutely very right. Much, very much so. My dad came over. He had a pretty tough time. Um, he raised seven children. Um, we all worked. We've all done really, really well. Um, very peaceful. Um, and with regards to the protests and, and everyone making that, that it's almost like you're making that Muslims are extreme. We're not extreme. We're actually quite a peaceful religion. And when you look at these protests, there's a mix of Christians, Muslims, um, you know, whoever, anyone that's got a heart is actually out there protesting. And I'm sick to death of hearing people saying that Muslims are awful people. Yeah, but and, are they? Because uh, even in this conversation and what Rishi Sunak said, Mm -hmm. You know, we, you say very passionately, this is not even the majority of people by any means and would echo your sentiments. And I said it on this show as well. But the reality is there is uh, Islamist extremism taking place and it's driving changes in politics, not in a healthy way. Threats. We, we should call that out whether it came from Roman Catholics or wherever. And that's the point, because otherwise we you. shut down that conversation, Zara. And I we don't just... agree with you. Can I, can I just say, I don't agree with you, because um, there's this thing that, that the British people always do, and you um, have this thing where you tell, tell us, if you're born in this country, on the, the thing that you're British, um, you, that, that's it, you don't take on any sort of ethnicity as such, but your consensus always tells me that I'm British Pakistani. So when I say I'm British Pakistani, all my white friends get offended. Well, not all of them, some of them get offended. Because, well, why are you using the Pakistani um, as your What's that got to do with extremism? No, no, but listen to me. No, what I'm trying to say to you is that you, you think because someone's a Muslim, they're extreme. No, I didn't say that at all. Sorry, I didn't say that. But you get extremists in every religion. Yeah, you do. But at the moment, the biggest threat is Islamist extremism into the UK. That's just where we are. But it used to be Irish terrorism. Yeah, and look how you treated them. Well, well, actually, we came to a peace agreement after many years. Oh, really? And is yeah, it's called Irish? it's called the Northern Ireland, and why, there's more. Why are the Irish so pro, so pro Palestine and Gaza, and they don't actually like what the British people are doing? The British government and the American government are honestly you're so complicit in this genocide. You call it a war, ah, and it's not a war. Ah, now it's we get genocide. to it. You see, it's, it's so one, but it is it's one side so of the war. It, it's Ukraine and, and Russia. Wouldn't it be good though if someone fighting. on those marches, Zara, actually carried a placard that said "Release the hostages now"? But you know something? The Hamas have actually said that they released them. Oh, really? Well. I, I haven't yes, noticed have. that. Yes, they have. It's funny how you only read what you want to read. Nick. No, I, I don't read. And I'm you're asking very you. Biased. You're very should, biased. Should someone? Should someone? No, listen. I'm very clear. Yeah, all hostages. Should, Look. Okay. Don't answer the question then. No, but I'm answering the question. Well, you're not. You should someone carry a placard? Do you think and actually yes. say release Hamas hostages, which they don't do, and the one person who does it gets set upon and attacked? something release all hostages on both sides 
whether they're, they're Israeli hostages or whether they're Palestinian You've just hostages. told me, release, though, release we're talking about the march, march, Sarah. Release them. Yeah, but you're talking about the march, and, you, and you're against the marches. No, you're I'm not against the marches. I'm you against are. those who break the law by supporting the terrorist group Hamas, OK? And, and putting up things on up. Parliament, so calling but, for the river to the sea, which is a genocide that you're busy that, fighting right, against. The river to the sea, but the river to the sea oh, is, here we is, go. is not... It's not what you think it no, is. No, of course it it's isn't. I'm completely it's wrong. So you're telling me that those people in Palestine shouldn't be free? No, you're I'm not telling you that at all. I'm telling you, you're if you break the law in this country and you support Hamas as a terrorist group, you should be arrested. No one's supporting Hamas. Really? They're supporting peace. And yes, really. Okay. I so, don't support Hamas. I didn't say you I did. Support Israel. I'm happy. I, all I want is his innocent children not to be killed. And as a human being, Nick, that's all you should want. It shouldn't be a case of let's talk about it. It should be a case of let's stop it. You're, you're bit, your mentality. You're, no, you're, you're, no, you're divorcing two different things there. You're two, d you are divorcing two they different things. Hand hand. You can still disapprove hand. of the action of Israel, but you don't have to be a supporter of Hamas. You don't He's have right. to make the assumption that all Hamas? Muslims are good and there are no uh, Islamic extremists, because the bottom line is there are Islamic extremists. You're same saying there are. People, That's ludicrous, same Sarah. Christian, same as white people, same as every colour, yet good and bad. And, 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 and when I talk to you about other uh, other forms of terrorism, OK, you just say, oh, yes, and they support they support uh, Gaza. You're not you're not open to another view. The Irish you, the Irish do you accept the there are Islamic extremists or not? Are, what, do you accept there are Christian extremists then, Nick? Do you accept there are Islamic but, extremists but or not? You, but there you, you go, you can't do it. I'm sorry, we have to go for time know. reasons, Sarah. I've given you so many options to answer that question. You couldn't do it. You are part of the problem, not part of the solution. Coming up, a good break from that. Steve Denyer, something for the weekend. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. All right, oi, oi, treat, go. When JK Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest. When a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. Now, you might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! <laughs> it's carry on what just <laughs> happened. <laughs> Whoa, <it's here. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I know it's I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. So he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. That's quite a small statue then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist did to, fail her. Yeah, we're we're supposed to it was another era. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth.
Oh, welcome back. I'm going to read this out. I don't, I, I don't read out ones that are normally nice to me. Hi, Nick. Brilliantly executed reply to that bigoted lady. Great show, Kate and Barnsley. Thank you very much. Now, Steve Denyer, we are going to move on. OK, I'm going to lead this session Oh, now. go on, Nick. Yes. OK. This, uh, I was part of my 65th birthday. I know, hard to believe, isn't it? You look Last great. Weekend, You're looking great. Thanks, thanks the makeup. My <laughs> wife took me, amongst other things, uh, a great weekend. We went to see The Unfriend with Lee Mack. Lee Mack. Play. Sadly, I think it's finishing soon. It was brilliant. Was it, he, is, he is in a class of his own, it isn't was, he? Uh, everything from facial expressions to the way the sitcom translated to stage. Yeah. The first half, I was chuckling. The second throughout, the second half, I was roaring with laughter. And it's, I can't even describe the plot. It's just a, it's, it's just basically almost how one slight untruth led to this chaos. Yeah. And, and they were essentially, the, the premise goes, kind of, ha were they housing an assassin who was this nice old lady sort of thing? It was just brilliant. Is I it slightly it. farcical as well? As yeah, well of course. As it is a little bit yeah, farcical. Yeah, you know, I, it's I a little bit things. like that. But it was just really good. And Great. Wyndham Theatre, it's only got about, I reckon it's only got about five, six hundred people. Nice in and it. intimate, isn't it? Really intimate. It was perfect. It was oh, really good. wonderful. OK. Well, he's so funny. Rob right, Bryden, that's it. You can go now. <laughs> Rob, yeah, thanks for that. Rob Brydon says he's the funniest man alive. Yeah, I can believe and it. And he's funny. Rob Brydon. Yeah, I mean, they're both incredible, aren't they? Let me start with lots of tributes coming through for Dave Myers, one and a half of the Hairy Bikers. Okay. He passed away this week of, of cancer. Chris Evans said uh, the other day, you know, what an amazing person. He'd been involved with Car Fest, uh, Chris's uh, big festival in yeah, the summer. Yeah. There was a big tribute this morning on uh, Saturday Kitchen and loads of tributes coming through. You seem to be coming on so regularly now when someone's died. Yeah. It's really, it's like, it I think it's one a week, be, doesn't there? A lot of them I kind of grew up with, you know, yeah. so... Uh, um, it's kind of sad, really. It is really sad when somebody... Maybe, that you... maybe I should stop you doing that. OK. See, and we just have cheerful stories. OK, well, let's go straight to the Brits. <laughs> it is the Brit Awards. Oh, yeah. okay. Now, uh, let's start off by talking about politics and the Brits. There's been no, lots that, of that's, that's controversial... So, Kenneth Baker, tell me, he was... Kenneth Baker was Education Secretary, a real Thatcherite. Yes, so he was invited to the 1989 Brit Awards. Uh, what happened to him? And he went on stage and basically 10,000 people booed him. OK. And he couldn't, he couldn't even announce the award that he wanted to announce. So the 1989 Brit Awards is possibly the most disastrous one, uh, thanks to Sam Fox. And, and, and so they got Nick a height Fleetwood. wrong, didn't they? Uh, let's have a look at this. I've got a uh, tiny clip for you. And right now to the best international male. Last year's Solo Artist Award has been split into separate male and female awards. This year's Best International Male nominations represent a clean sweep for black music. Sam, who are the lucky five? Here you go. I need a freak you can talk Michael Jackson. It was just a complete disaster. She, uh, I mean, that was just a little bit of all the things that but went wrong. Am I right? She was too small for the podium or something? Well, so they deliberately thought they'd have a laugh when they went on stage, and oh. he went to the small microphone, oh. and she couldn't reach his microphone. Oh, right. So immediately it looked really strange. She claims that they put lots of Bross fans down the front, so she couldn't hear any of the director's kind of feedback. Also, the, the woman doing the teleprompter, the, the auto cue, apparently couldn't hear either. So so oh, it was all out. Well, it's like so working with my production team. <laughs> Tech up. Dave does that. You know, he's, he hasn't got he's a clue. Just, I think there's a lot. We're in control of it. <laughs> um, so she said, ladies and gentlemen, you know, Tina Turner and the four tops walked on. <laughs> and it was just the whole thing when... So uh, is it Brits? I mean, ever since I watched that, I've never watched the Brits again. I, oh, just, really? Yeah, all these just, years later? Rubbish. Yeah, and I've never well, watched Well, let it, me bring yeah. you another disaster. This happened in 1998. This is John Prescott. Oh, yes. Who turned up at the Brits because, you know, Labour were very much into the... Call Britannia. Call Britannia. So they turned up yeah, yeah. and then a band called Chumbawamba went over with a, a bucket of ice cold water and poured it over his head. It's on live television. He Ooh. then stormed out. He got stroppy, didn't he? Well, his dignity would have been offended he by was, that. He was, you know, he barged out. Uh, another great moment was Madonna. Now, look at this. But Madonna I, falling off stage in to be 2015. <laughs> you me, me strong. Me up and I could do Whoa, whoa, whoa. Fall off stage. The cape got 
stuck. So the dance apparently worked perfectly in rehearsals, but they tried to, obviously one of the dancers is like trying to pull the cape off, but actually pulled, I mean, that's quite a hefty fall, wasn't it? So I tell you, though, wherever steps are involved, the stage is <laughs> like that, I was terrified. As a politician, that you'd oft, they'd often sit you in the front row of some big event and they put reserved on your seat, but it yeah. would just be a bit of paper sellotaped onto the chair. So I went into one, and there were about 200 people there, and I was slightly, oh, God, how's, how's this <laughs> going to go? So I sat in my chair, and I got up to go and speak, rushed up the stairs, and everyone was starting to laugh, and I thought, well, I haven't said anything yet, but, of course, this bit of paper with <laughs> reserved was now stuck on my backside your back side. <laughs> as I went up the steps. And it's, and, and is then, this on YouTube? Let me have a quick no, look. No, 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 okay. But the worst thing about, I think it was before YouTube, the worst <laughs> thing about it is steps. You are just thinking, I must not fall over. I did Joe Biden stuff. I must not fall over. I must not yes, fall over. Yeah. I didn't. I don't think I ever fell over. Madonna always tends to use steps. About half a year after that happened, she then continued to do exactly the same act and it got the biggest cheer of the night when the cape came off yeah, and great. she wasn't pulled back but yeah, anyway yeah. Brit Awards 8.30 tonight Dua yeah. Lipa who's just about the biggest pop star will open it uh, all eyes on an artist called Ray Harry Styles won all the big awards Still last around? year no oh. nominations this oh, year good. it's interesting um, it's kind of live it's in delay I think it's a minute oh, well, delay so they tonight. can cut the rubbish when it goes wrong they more. cut swearing out oh. it's very very safe these Days, since it went to uh, to ITV, rock stars are meant to break guitars and yeah. swear. I mean, Jarvis rebel. Cock again on stage uh, during Michael Jackson's Earth song, and he got his bottom out. Do you remember? No, because I don't the... watch it. <laughs> <laughs> You've got about twenty five years to I catch know, up I've on. Got, I've got I'm sorry, I'm, being, I'm just keeping an eye on the clock because I, I overran because of that call. But I, I don't want to deny you of your your time. Yeah, well, Mariah Carey tonight. But you're uh, not watching it, are you? Well, I'm going to the Tower of London tonight yeah, to be locked I want to up. say hello to Spike, who's one of the beef eaters who watches talk. Oh, and brilliant! He's invited me and my parents to go down to watch the ceremony of the keys ah uh, yes apparently it's a very like they've been doing it's, it for I've, hundreds of years i've been to see it it was brilliant is yeah, it amazing yeah, yeah i think it's the royal artillery that are in charge of that's um, right yeah there which is my son's regiment so there's a little um, pub inside the tower of london which only yes. people who work there can go to yeah. it's called the keys so you're going I'm taking my parents tonight oh, so okay, thank you spike well you'll uh, have a good time you are Enjoy amazing and uh, can i talk about so mariah carey best of mariah carey bbc2 tonight 10 15 if you're staying in netflix is this um there's, there, there's this kind of rom-com that everyone's talking about. It's known as, people are saying this is the most binge-watchable thing. It's called One Day. I wondered if we could have a quick yes, look at the yes, trailer. Yes, 30 seconds that. of yeah. the trailer. It's one of the great cosmic mysteries. How is that someone can go from being a total stranger to being the most important person in your life? What do you want to be when you're 40? Am I allowed to say ripped? Right. All right, you. So that's just a little bit. It's um, it's got a great soundtrack. I've seen it advertised. It's got yeah. a wonderful soundtrack. Everybody's been raving about this. So I've watched the first episode. There's a few episodes. Oh, tough job. Um, it's. You know, the characters aren't immediately likeable, but you really get kind of sucked into the action. And it's a really famous novel that was released a few years ago, kind of like a rom-com based on that. It was a David Nichols um, book. But after watching the first episode, I'm dying to watch the second uh, one. Okay. It looks really All good. Right. Okay. All right. Gigs tonight. You have a great job. Can I recommend this? Because I was there in Bournemouth on Thursday night. Belinda Carlisle, Rick Astley. On stage I together. I can't stand Rick Axley. I told you oh, I got he's... in trouble. So he listens regularly and his mother does. I went to the Royal Variety Show and I had to pretend to like him. Oh, what a show, man. Why didn't you like him? Oh, he's just dull. He's amazing. He's dull. Honestly, it was a rainy <laughs> Thursday night in Bournemouth and we sat there and Belinda did a great job. But when he a came A rainy on... night in Bournemouth and Rick Astley, I'm <laughs> think, I think that is as bad as it gets. He was incredible. Stop being... Stop being moody. He really was incredible. He does. Like, anyone who does Harry Styles, ACDC, he covered some Motown songs, all of his big songs. The two backing singers he's got uh, could do a show of their own. They're incredible singers. And by the end of it, I thought, what a great night. I haven't had a night as good as that for ages. So, Belinda Carlisle, her final show with him tonight, um, and it starts just at 10 to 7. Right? I just want to clarify, because I know I'll get lots of messages about this. You're paid to go and do this stuff, aren't you? I mean, this is how it works, isn't it? You go out there, you are Mr Entertainment, <laughs> and you either 
you know, you're just going free or you get paid. It is a brilliant job. I think we... Why are people... I'm, I'm very lucky, but I, I love doing like, this. They should have a go at you, not XMPs. Well, some people, some people have messaged and said Steve loves everything, but the point is I, I don't want to come on and t tell you about bad stuff. I want to come on and be I'd, I'd tell enthusiastic you, quite enough of that. about yes. things, yeah, you know. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, yeah. It's always well, good, good to see you. So that's the Steve Daniel something for the weekend, isn't it? That's it what is. we're calling this slot now, isn't yeah, it? It's kind of yeah, really absolutely. friendly. By the way, Kim Wilde yes, is I my like guest Kim Wilde. on Virgin Radio. Oh. Plus. Have you got 10 seconds? Or yes, we... play it. Can we play a bit of Kim? Yes. Can I, can I ask you, do you remember your first Top of the Pops appearance? Yes. Um, was it a lot of pressure? Was it nerve-wracking? I do remember being very uh, scared and terrified and everyone sort of said, oh, you look so cool. You were daring the, the camera and you were doing all this sort of like hardly moving stuff and that was sheer terror. <laughs> that wasn't me being oh, cool. She sounds great, She Steve. was so she, good. She, she is, she is, uh, that's, that's when? 4.30pm every day next week. She's also on Virgin Road 80s Plus tomorrow morning at 10 with her own show. Brilliant. The Kim Wild 80s show. That's brilliant and uh, I'll be, I will uh, definitely be listening to that. That's fantastic. Steve Denny is something for the weekend. Thank, thank you, me. thank you, thank you very much. Coming up at the top of the hour, complete change subject here um doesn't stop you calling about what you want to talk about but i'm going to be visiting something very very close to my heart we're going to be talking and having a discussion about is it time to change the laws for assisted dying i say yes i'd like to hear from you as well oh three four 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 double nine one thousand you can whatsapp on that number but join me here after the break This is Talk TV. For the news that matters, for the opinions that matter, for the stories that matter, find me, Vanessa Feltz, every weekday at 4 pm, only on Talk, on TV, on radio, online, and on your smart speaker. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online, and you're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman. Trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right too. Yay. Quite Yay. right too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <Whirl, is it? laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the fourth plinth. Mr Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I, know what's, I know what's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, <laughs> a trans... Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, what, did fail her. Yeah, we're we're supposed to it was another era. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth.
That's when I was getting used to my show, What Just Happened, being on Talk TV every Friday night at 10.30. They go and change it. I'm furious. They've moved it to 8.30 every Friday. Talk TV, What Just Happened. I am furious. always enjoy my chat with Steve Denyer and so too does um, Adam. Nick, I'm with you. Rick's Astley songs are like a horrible earworm. I, I do like Belinda, says Adam. See, we cover all subjects here. Um, now, I do want to turn to something uh, that I think we are going to be talking about a lot more in the future. And it's one of those issues I think you can have a healthy, rational discussion over. But he, people hold very passionate views about it one way or the other. And as, as essentially, a report by MPs um, has now said that with the possibility of changes to uh, assisted dying taking place, um, for example, in Scotland, you, the UK government needs to be prepared to have a look at this discussion. Now, all of this is possible and probable and nothing uh, definitive. And the issue of assisted dying has also come in uh, to the attention of not just politicians but everyone else because you know Esther Ranson, one of our best known and, and much loved broadcasters, um, has uh, herself stage four cancer and she says she wants the choice of a pain-free dignified private death. Now when I was an MP having to vote on an issue like this was always generally regarded as a matter of conscience. I did not have the opportunity to vote on it. It did not come before Parliament when I was there uh, but uh, it was often discussed and my view at the time had formed around that I was actually against changing the law and then I freely admit even though it's drawn some criticism personal family experience changed my view radically. I mean, you couldn't have gone from one to the other uh, more because of that experience for a number of reasons. So I think, uh, you know, this is a discussion that we uh, should have and will continue to have. I want you to be part of that discussion, 0344 for double nine one thousand. Uh, many of you have already shared your views with me. Um, and you can also WhatsApp that same number, 0344 for double nine one thousand. As usual, using the word talk, you can text 87222. But to kick us off, I'm really pleased to have Peter Williams, um, who's the director of the Family Education Trust, and Claire MacDonald, um, who's the director of My Death, My Solution. Join me to discuss this. So thank you both very much uh, for joining me on this discussion. You will have heard very briefly of my my, my journey from one view to, to the other. Um, I suppose the most common um, argument that I came across and which swayed me at the time was that the changing the law to allow assisted dying could end up with people being put under an unnecessary pressure uh, with all sorts of responsibilities being put forward towards them. Um, and that was a reason that there were insufficient safeguards against that. Um, Peter, can I ask you, do you think that that is perhaps the main argument as to why we shouldn't do uh, change the law? Yes, I do. And thank you for having me on, by the way. Um, I really think that the key concern that those of us who are against introducing euthanasia or assisted suicide into this country or indeed any country is precisely that the safeguards have never been shown to be there, that there has been an expansion of the number of people who have been subject to euthanasia or assisted suicide in other jurisdictions. And that therefore, if we have a responsibility, as I believe that we do, to the most vulnerable members of society, then we have a duty to prevent those practices that are going to lead to them being compromised due to their lack of personal autonomy, uh, whether that be the elderly, whether that be the disabled, whether that be the very seriously ill, even if not, if not terminally ill, anyone indeed mentally ill, e anyone indeed who is going to be uh, potentially subject to these kinds of laws, which can never be limited to just one group if it's being uh, taken consistently. Peter, the, um, uh, just, just, just before I go to, to Claire, let me respond to that by, by saying the fear if you like, of the vulnerable effectively being exploited, for want of a, a better word, um, I would say now is trumped by the actual horror, I think, of the choice being put in front of people, such as in my experience, where 
The patient wanted no further treatment. The doctors accepted that judgment. The family did not want their, um, their father, in this case, to suffer anymore. And yet, because there was no assisted dying laws, he basically starved to death for six days in a hospital. That's no way to treat human beings. I quite agree. And of course, he wouldn't have starved to death um, by the doctors. That would have been his choice to do that. But what I would say is that the problem here is that we have two imperfect situations. On the one hand, we have an imperfect, uh, imperfect situation we have right now, which is that we have high protections, the most vulnerable members of our society, which, as we see from places like Belgium or Holland or elsewhere, are, con are actually undermined when we introduce to suicide and euthanasia. Or we have a situation, as with suicide and euthanasia, where those people are undermined, um, but those people who have the self-confidence to want to end their own life actually are able to end their own lives. Now, there is a trade-off there, a very key trade-off. And I think that what I would err on is the side of protecting many, many, many more vulnerable people than those very, very few people who are self-confident enough that they want to commit suicide, they want to end their own lives and be given medical assistance in so okay. doing. All right. Um, Claire, um, how, how, uh, how much... This sounds awful word, Claire, but how much demand do you think there is, to answer Peter's point, for people to be having the option to end their own life? Well, the British public is overwhelmingly in favour of change. Um, consistently, it's over 75% of people saying that the status quo lacks compassion and drives people to desperate measures. So I think the very best way to protect the most vulnerable is to have assisted dying with all the appropriate safeguards, as they do in many other countries. But perhaps I could just press you on, on this point a little bit. Uh, um, uh, the, the other arguments I used to get uh, when discussing this was that actually, uh, and Claire Muldoon, who was on this programme earlier, made this point, that you can have um, a, a, shall we say, a satisfactory death if we have upped our game on palliative care. Is, is, isn't that a, not a legitimate claim to make? I hear far too many stories from people and from their families where palliative care has been offered and taken, but it's just not good enough. Um, it isn't possible for modern medicine to uh, cure and relieve all suffering. And uh, if people are suffering towards the end of their lives or have a condition that um, causes them huge and uh, terrible pain and distress, then I think they should have the right to choose to ask for a proper medical safeguarded death. Peter, for all your concerns about safeguards, and, and, and you, you talked about other countries, Holland, um, Belgium, and, and I think uh, one of my guests today talked about Canada um, mm. as one of those people who, if you like, have expanded um, uh, the, the right to dying. The, the, the fact of the matter is, uh, where there may be critics in those countries, there's been no change to the law. So doesn't that say the law is working on assisted dying? Quite the contrary. In fact, the, ch the law has changed. In Canada, they initially started with terminal illness only, then they've expanded it very re recently to unbearable suffering. So in other words, anybody uh, can achieve um, assisted suicide. Yeah, sorry, I did, uh, sorry to interrupt you, but that's my point, is it's actually therefore been considered acceptable? and been well used because they have now the confidence to expand the law. They, they have the confidence to expand the law, but that means that more vulnerable people are being affected. In fact, very high numbers of people, if we look at places like Oregon or Washington State where they have just assisted suicide, numbers of people are actually going for assisted suicide euthanasia because they feel they're a burden on other people, not because they're suffering terrible pain. The answer to terrible pain is palliative care. But these, the concern for assisted suicide and euthanasia is drawn by despair. It's drawn by people not being able to do the kind of things they want to do previously. And that's why it can't be limited, as the advocates in this country for assisted suicide would like, simply to terminal illness. Because people who are, for example, in a paraplegic state or people who are very severely disabled, any number of people who have these serious conditions would want to have access potentially to that kind of suicide. But we really and why want... shouldn't they have it though? If you are suffering with MND, you are in a wheelchair, your quality of life is uh, very low. 
uh, that's what I can't get my head around now, is why shouldn't I be able to have that right? It's my life. Well, we limit medical autonomy or the freedom to choose in many different areas so that we can give the greatest possible safeguards to the most vulnerable members of our society. One example I would use of that is the use of antibiotics, right? There are lots of people who want to use antibiotics, want the medical choice to use them for things like the common cold. Doctors say no to that and they deny their medical autonomy on the basis that if we overuse antibiotics, then very many more vulnerable people, many more sick people would be adversely affected by the uh, by the limitation of the effectiveness of those kinds of drugs. So we do limit medical autonomy in all sorts of individual situations. And we do that because we want to make sure that the common good is best served. So whilst I totally get if you were, if any one of us were in a situation where we were in a very great limitation of our ability to do things as in paraplegia, I mean, pr profound situation, but we should want to have a situation whereby the greatest possible safeguards are there for the greatest possible number of people. Okay. Even well, that does be limiting... Let, let me put that to, to Claire. Claire, um, th there's effectively scepticism for those who do not support the, the campaign that safeguards work. What do you, what do you, how do you respond to that? I think you just mentioned it earlier, that you said that no country who has uh, had assisted dying legislation brought in has chosen to go back on that. If it were the case that vulnerable people were being put under pressure or people were felt that they had to uh, uh, choose an assisted death in order not to be a burden, then a society in these democratic countries would uh, vote against it in order to protect their most vulnerable. And that, that doesn't happen. That doesn't happen. One of the most shocking things for me was that um, uh, whilst I kind of understand the palliative care arguments, I was in a hospital um, where, the, where, where our family were dealing with this issue. And we were told after day four of watching our relative having refused treatment, uh, Claire, that they said, um, look, we don't do death very, we don't know how to manage death in our hospital. Uh, there was an extraordinary that we, we were told on day one that, that it would be very quick um, once medical treatment was denied. And just as someone who's texted me has said, you know, their father was told the same thing. It was nine days later that they died. I mean, I, this sounds a bit of a cliche, but we wouldn't treat an animal like that, Claire. Why is there still so much resistance politically to changing the law when the public seem to want it? I don't think there is political resistance now. I think that um, in 2015, uh, when um, a bill in Parliament on assisted dying was uh, was defeated, uh, there were far fewer examples. So we couldn't look to actual evidence. People had all these fears about what might happen and how the vulnerable might be put at risk. But now we have evidence. And um, now that uh, the British Parliament can, uh, can look to the evidence from other countries, that's what they're willing to do. Do you think that, that vote is coming? I, I think it is, but I'm, I'm, not, sh I'm not sure. The, the, vote, the vote is coming. Because if you've, got, if you've got assisted dying being legal in Jersey, the Isle of Man, Scotland's going through its own uh, legislation soon, it would be very strange and mm. difficult for England and Wales not okay, to have... OK, listen, Claire, thank you. Very, very briefly, Peter, um, if we get it in one part of the United Kingdom, uh, you've got to have it everywhere, haven't you? Because otherwise you, you literally will be passporting people to another part of the region. Quite the contrary. I think that if, if that were to begin, it should begin at Westminster because we have the greatest institutions for making sure that there are the greatest possible uh, analysis of this kind of uh, procedure. We actually had lots of evidence in 2015 from various different jurisdictions. And we found that it was a very bad idea. It's an even worse idea now, given the evidence from Canada. I don't think jurors in the Isle of Man have the potential to have the ability to look at these into the greatest possible depth in the way that Westminster has. And I think that Westminster, if, when it has looked at it, has always said, no, this is a terrible, we, terrible... We, we shall see. Um, look, to both of you, I really do appreciate you coming on to talk about this. Peter Williams, Director of Family Education Trust, Claire MacDonald, director my death my solution the only reason I, I brought that to the end for the last couple of minutes is i've got a caller on the line um lisa from cardiff who you'd, you'd like to talk about this subject lisa so thank you very much oh thank you nick for taking my call and i'll try and speak slower than i did last time <laughs> uh, right. of course i remember now far it, away it's, it's such a um important topic 
um, I lost, if I give you some brief, um, I lost my mum 14 years ago, aged 61, to esophageal cancer. And I was lucky enough to be with her and nurse her uh, while she died at home. Uh, three years ago, I lost my stepfather, who was 95. Um, I, again, I was privileged to be with him, and it was during COVID. Um, both were on syringe drivers. Um, yep, and I, I, know, I, I know what they are. They're, they're, <coughs> this, this is a permanent um, dispensing yep. of a drug yep. at, on demand, effectively, Absolutely. isn't it? Absolutely. Yep. And I do believe that um, the doctors, even though they wouldn't tell you, they do, when they know someone is not going to recover, they do slip them away over the syringe drivers. It's just a natural process. Oh, can I tell you something here? Where, yep. in a way... Uh, I, I, I wish that were true in, a, in, a, in that sort of uh, odd sort of way. But yep. how about this? We were told yep. when our, um, our relative was clearly in pain, unconscious yep. at this point, yep. clearly in pain, yep. we said, can we have more of this particular drug? They said, yep. oh, he's, he's, he, he's got to... Go, I can't have another dose oh. for at least another two hours. That's just terrible. To which point we said... What's the worst that can happen? Uh -huh. He could die. Yeah. That, that is why I think this, 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 this country's got it wrong. Of course. And, of course, the last um, human right we have over our own bodies, bearing in mind if we're of sane mind, and that's the difficult thing, it's our last personal choice. When my time comes, I would like to be surrounded with my family, them holding my hands and slip away, rather than being in some awful agony... Uh, uh, um, mm. God, a, a terrible death. And mm. I do think it needs to come in. OK, well, listen, um, thank you very much for putting that call, uh, uh, putting that case so uh, so eloquently. Uh, you tell me your views. You're sending in lots of, lots of messages uh, in uh, about this, and I will get to read some of them out. Uh, broadly speaking, I think there's actually um, broader support for it, um, although one or two against it. 0344 double nine one thousand. Keep calling about that. Send me your messages. Likewise, you can WhatsApp on 0344 four double nine one thousand. Next, we're going to be having another look at the slave play, where number ten criticises the plan for black-only audiences. All here and more on Talk TV with me, Nick Dubois. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. Now, you ain't Talk. gonna have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat, go. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm, I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on. <laughs> what just happened? <laughs> Whoa, listen. <laughs> there was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth blimp. Mr Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I, know what's, I know what's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> ah, <laughs> a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> <I just> 40 <laughs> minutes, 40. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family, 
And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist we're, we're, we're did fail to, her. We're we're supposed to it was another era. That. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Um, I'm just going to read a few of these messages out on assisted dying and, and thank you for your comments. Thanks. In fact, lots of comments coming in today and I, I must get back to some about that call from Zara as well, who, who uh, didn't go into listening mode, really. Um, whilst I do have compassion for anyone who is very poorly, I think human nature would sadly mean a change in the law would be too open to abuse and vulnerable people exploited. We can't let that happen to anyone, says Rachel. Um, that was what one of our guests in that debate was having. Dan from Kent, I'm really torn about assisted dying. Um, Nick, uh, on this 10th anniversary of my beloved father's passing, he wanted to die because of the pain, and I say with a broken heart, he did, he did fortunately in the days to come. But my son, once suicidal, is now living life to the full with happiness. And I can understand that. Um, similar thing with my mother, actually, but not suicide, I hasten to add. Nick, I have stage four renal cancer that is incurable. Very sorry to hear this, Craig. When my quality of life has gone, I should be able to make the decision to end my life. That decision should be overseen by a judge and medical professionals. Um, Nick, I agree with assisted dying, but not what they are planning. It's open to abuse by the state. Just look at Canada. They have even offered it to war vets suffering from PTSD. Um, again, uh, it, it, lots on this vein, and um, thank you for that. Let's go to uh, Janice in Essex on assisted dying. Janice, hello. Um, hi, Nick. I, I'll speak to you again, because yeah. you, there's two people that you two on my life like. You and Petri. Anyway, oh, thank you. Uh, I missed you last week, by uh, the way. Sorry. Um, <laughs> I won't go away again. Well, I will actually. I'm not here tomorrow. Sorry. Uh, I'll watch you on another channel, so I'll, <laughs> no, I'll still no. get my little face. OK. All right. <laughs> right. Um, my father died for lung cancer. He was misdiagnosed and for an extremely fit man. He died at festival. It was the most agonising death mm. that I could ever imagine. Then my mother died with um, emphysema and mm. a couple of other things, but they operated on her a day, the day that she was going to die, and because they said, well, she's not going to come out of it. And I've got lung disease. I don't want to face the same thing that Gosh. they've had. Yeah. I can't take any medication because the medication I've had in the previous... That I can't take painkillers, I can't take morphine. So I am going to die in agony unless somebody does me the favour where I'm in a hospital bed and gives me a nice little wave of of ketamine. And I think, I'm, I, well, you're, you give me my brain back because I've been in IT most of my life and I've still got my brain because of mm. your channel. Mm. So I can listen to things that interest me. Once that's gone, there's no point. Well, Janice, listen. I have no family. Janice, um, uh, I'm, I'm sorry to hear all of that. I appreciate your remarks about this channel. We all do. Uh, and, and I totally understand where you are coming from. And you would have been the sort of person, had I had to explain why I didn't support it a few months ago, uh, sorry, a few years ago, I would have, it would have given me pause for thought. And I'm sure you will give other people pause for thought. I do support changing the law now. And thank you very much indeed for sharing uh, that experience with us. That's Janice in Essex, who a regular contributor to this show. And it's really good to hear that, you know, we're, well, it, it, a bit of a lifeline, I suppose. I hope she won't mind me choosing those words. Now, uh, on a, another subject, I've um, been talking a little bit about the uh, so-called um, uh, all-black identifying audiences uh, that have been 
put forward as a suggestion by the directors of a show uh, where the idea is that uh, it is excluded to all audiences except BAME audiences. Now, that has been slightly modified since, where they're saying, look, we wouldn't turn anyone away. But the idea here is that uh, you uh, can come to this show, you are the principal invitee, if you are of uh, a black or minority ethnic group, and you won't have to watch, quote, under um, uh, a white gaze, which I don't find a very inclusive language at all. I don't want to get hysterical about this. I do think, personally, that this seems divisive to me, but I do want to explore if there is any merit in it, it, it because the argument goes that many people from BME, uh, BAME communities uh, feel excluded from the West End and from theatre. Uh, and the attendance numbers would suggest there, might, there, there certainly is uh, a small proportion uh, of uh, BAME uh, uh, audiences in shows. But is this really the answer? So to help me discuss this and navigate it, I'm pleased to welcome Judita De Silva, uh, who's an international journalist. Hello. Nice to, nice to be here. Thanks for having me. Well, well, thanks very much indeed. Look, I know there can be a little bit of sort of um, knee-jerk hysterical reaction to this, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to avoid that. Um, even though I had a little bit of it myself when I first read it, I said, what, 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 what? So, um, I mean, the, the truth of the matter is, uh, I think it's absolutely true that the, the, the uh, audiences from BME groups are really very low uh, uh, compared to the size of the population. Um, so, sure, it'd be great to open it up. But do is the answer to opening up theatre to groups who are feeling excluded or for whatever reason are not going, is the answer really to say a black only audience? I mean, first of all, as you said, there's been it's been corrected and should I say like modified that he didn't say that anyone would be excluded. Hmm. He said that the primary marketing would be to black audiences. While I think the execution of his message was questionable, I understand the motivation because as you've touched on, when you think of theater, but what ethnic minority communities feel about theatre is similar to what working class communities feel about theatre. It's historically, it's market to, marketed towards middle middle class to upper middle class and beyond white people because at the end of the day it's not convention to for one to believe that black people that your commercial theaters are marketing Chekhov and Pinter and Stoppard to black people they just aren't so when you have a play like this one it's written by a black playwright it speaks to the black experience to history to nuances of the of the culture and the people and the community it's kind of tailored to that audience that otherwise might have felt left out so why not do something seismic in the marketing like operandum for it to tell black people to tell ethnic minority groups that no this is theater that you perceive as white but we're want, we're inviting you we want you we're speaking to you so these doors that you otherwise would have thought were closed we're swinging them open and saying come on in you can't market everything like that but it's trying to create a seismic shift in the status quo to, to, to open up this landscape a bit more sure now uh, that is a rational um, sort of way of looking at it, and I understand that, and, and, and sort of I have some sympathy with it. But equally, um, is this really just a marketing exercise? Have they succeeded already because they've got us talking about the show, so it's job done? Actually, why do you need now to make it that divisive element that many will see here by saying, and I know it's been modified since, but principally... It's a, for a black audience only, because now the test will be, it's hard to think anyone hasn't heard of it, that they're either going to come or they're not going to come. And, and, and that surely will be the test of this. I mean, it goes to the old show, no publicity is bad publicity, because if you even you look at the history of this play, which had historically the most Tony nominations, didn't bring home any wins. It's been controversial from the start. There were protests that it shouldn't have been put on on Broadway, but it was. So I do think an element of it is the shock tactics of modern day marketing, which have worked because even we're discussing it now. But it does speak to a broader conversation, because even when you had that thing of that soundbite of the white gaze, 
it's about a very specific kind of experience. If you cast your mind back to years ago when they were talking about integration in the workplace and how it feels being minorities, particularly black people, and they was one of the executives at Fujitsu that said when she's training the companies she works for, that she tells them you will never know what it feels like to walk into a room and be the only white person there. That is the daily lived experience of ethnic minorities. When you when you live an existence that's governed by okay. maintaining the comfort of those around you, it puts you under But let's repression. explore that a little bit, Judita, because I'm not going to challenge that. It's not for me. I'll never experience it. So, so I, I understand the point that you're making there. But actually, is the, is, is, is the answer really exclusion rather than inclusion. The buzzword these days is all about inclusivity. This is the exact opposite of it, isn't it? And as number 10 say, that they'd be concerned by restricting audiences on the base of race could be wrong and divisive. Are you not a, a touch uncomfortable that there's some truth in that? Um, initially, I was I was uncomfortable because I said it's doing the same thing in reverse. But then he said that was not his intention. He would never turn away anyone to come and see his play. He wants as many people to see it as possible. What he's saying is that those who would normally be instinctively inclined to ignore it because they feel they're not included, he's shouting the loudest to them that, no, please come along. But everybody is welcome. So having this space where you, because the play itself is really quite raw when it with the topics it deals with, with sexuality and rape. So it's kind of like when they say when you watch that, um, when you watch TV at home with your family as opposed to when you watch it in public, there's a way you feel, there's a comfort, there's an ease with the yeah. environment being one populated by people like you, that changes the viewing experience. And that's what he's trying to simulate. Yeah, I, um, look again, I, I sort of un understand, I think I understand the anger you're saying because I, I won't experience it as, 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 as I've said all along. Um, I suppose the, the, the interesting thing for me is I did look up some statistics that showed that actually, for example, in, in uh, compared to the, the, the national population, which I think is about 81% what we described as, as white British, 19% of, of different ethnicities, I think something like 4 or 5% is, is, is black. And actually, it's great to see, you know, uh, something like 20% of people employed in London in um, uh, culture and the arts, according to the Arts Council England, uh, are, are from BAME communities. In terms of grants being allocated to support projects um, from the BAME community, well above grants that are going elsewhere, something like 37, 37.5%. These are all, um, you know, absolutely, totally legitimate things. But I suppose I'm, I'm poised to say, if that hasn't worked, by having more people work in the arts, not just the theatre, I hasten to add, more people working in the arts, more funding going toward the arts. Is there a sense that we're kind of knocking at a door that's not really going to move because it could, people are priced out of the West End rather than necessarily feeling, you know, this is, um, this is a, a hostile environment I may not be comfortable in? Um, I think yes and no. First of all, it has to be a twofold effort because when you're investing in the creatives and the people behind the scene creating the works, creating these works, you also have to motivate um, the marketing in order to get the attention of the people that these works speak to, which, he's, which is what this playwright is doing, but doing it in a very graphic way. But he has also spoken to pricing out these particular communities. That's why a, a number of tickets have been priced, and I believe it's 200 tickets are going to be sold for one pound only. Some will be t sold for 20 pounds. And that's why I made that com um, comparison. Yeah, you do, you do end up with that in. tension, don't you, where you could be selling, if you like, to one ethnic group tickets at one pound and to others tickets at 20, 30 pounds. That's a bit risky as well, isn't it? No, but it's, it's first come, first serve who gets those. But it's like what I was saying about the experience, the approach and the perception held by black communities is similar to the perception held by working class communities. It's seen as a space that's not for us. So okay. you've got to do something to make you feel that, no, it truly is for you as well as anyone else okay. in order to recalibrate the demographics attending. Um, Judita, um, thank you very much for joining us, having a sensible conversation around that subject. I do appreciate it. That's Judita Da Silva, international journalist. But what's your thoughts? I mean, I've tried to give good voice there to why this is being done, and I think I put down some fair challenges. How do you feel about this attempt? Do you agree with number 10 that restricting audiences on the basis of race would be wrong and divisive? 
Or are there some merits to this? Or are you just not bothered at all, maybe? 0344 499 1000. Or you can tweet me at Nick Dubois. Now, let's go to John in Waterlooville. John, hello. You'd like to talk about assisted dying? Uh, yes, please. Yeah, far please. away. Um, I'm a stonemason, you know, and I worked on, on, on building sites all my life. Um, and I even worked in the days when there were only three health and safety officers in Great Britain for building sites, all the way through to 10, 20, 30 years later, when in fact I'm working on the area chief of, of uh, health and safety, Mr. Cowdy, right. for the whole of the southeast of England. And what we have to understand is that, you know, that all lives matter and, and that health and safety is a presence within our, our area. And as such, now that I'm stage four liver collapse, I, four doctors have already said, Mr. Gordon, how are you still alive? And I say, it's a miracle. Um, but if I thought for one minute that someone was going to assist me to die, then I should surely consider that person as a murderer. When I've spent all of my life adding days and, and, and weeks Yes, uh, and protecting lives uh, um, yes, through health and safety. Lives. But it, it would yes. only happen if you... You wanted it to happen, wouldn't it, John? Isn't that the point? Well, what if the, the only person who's going to assist you dying is under the circumstances where someone says, I'm so ill, my quality of life is beyond um, I, uh, be, beyond um, uh, what is acceptable well, I'm for I'm not me. so sure of that. You know, I think that death is part of the journey of life. And as a stonemason drenched in the knowledge, I can only say that the Ten Commandments are firm in our minds. Okay. And that if anyone should assist me in dying whilst I beg for another minute or beg to die, anyone should assist me in my, in my efforts to die, then we are clearly talking about a murderer, are we not? Well, that is potentially what the law is saying at the moment, although they're not prosecuting on that basis. And yet, when you hear some of the stories of people um, who are suffering in pain, the one, the example I gave you of our family, who actually refused treatment, John, and the doctors agreed that this was um, uh, acceptable and the family wanted to say their goodbyes and, and this particular individual said, I can't go on like this, it's too, it's too painful. And yet, because we didn't have assisted dying laws, this person effectively starved themselves to death, albeit unconscious. It's a tough call. Thank you for putting your case um, there, John. Uh, about assisted dying, uh, and and he, as he said, he spent all his life trying to protect people, uh, and thinks assisted dying is murder. What do you think? Oh three four 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 double nine one thousand. Uh, what's at me? Oh three four 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 double nine one thousand. Now we have a WhatsApp. I I, th I thought we ought to try this um, because someone actually left a voice message on WhatsApp. So uh, I'm looking anxiously at the production team to say. Oh, shall we play it rather than me read a message out? Hi, Nick. I'm from South East London. I'm 45-ish. And I just wanted to say that as much as I love our country, the diversity, all what that brings, it is really disheartening when your 75-year-old dad tells you that this country's finished and it's nothing like the country his dad thought he was fighting for. And that's a little bit heartbreaking. I think there's a lot of people who've had that experience as well. So you can WhatsApp your message any way you wish to do, or better still, you can call me. That's what we're going to focus on for the last 20 minutes of the show, 0344 499 1000. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. All right, oi, oi, treat, go. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman is not a woman. Trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Quite right, too. It's that time again.
to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. Now, you might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia, reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, there was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I know it's I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. So he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. That's quite a small statue then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, a trans. Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist did to, fail her. Yeah, we were supposed it to was have another moved on from era. That. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. So, welcome back. Thank you for your messages. Uh, WhatsApp, uh, I think it was... Uh, oh, here we are. Yes. Um, hi, from Dan Brooks. Hi, Nick. Would you give me a mention as I'd watch your show from the start? I'm Dan, and I'm enjoying listening to your views and opinions. Of course I will, Dan. I've just done it. Uh, Glyn, he says, the whole point of integration is there are no black communities, no Muslim communities, no white communities, just British communities. Nick, hi Nick, to have a black only audience at the slave play is racist against white people and is hypocritical. And if they had a white only audience at a play, it would be racist and like apartheid. Andy in Wiltshire, quite a few on uh, that theme. Now, um, uh, as I said, this hour is for me to go through your messages and take your calls. Let's go and take one of the calls. Paul has dialed 0344 1000. Hello, Paul. Oh, oh actually, you know? Paul, Paul, before you say anything, um, I've, uh, I've had to correct the production team because we had that WhatsApp message that came in and they never told me who it was. Her name was Natasha. Natasha, if you're listening, we did play it. I hope you heard it and thank you for your message. Paul, back to you. Yeah, how are you doing? I'm very well, actually. I'm a bit exhausted. It's been a great show and in, in, in so many people wanting to contribute as well. What would you like to talk about? Yeah, well, I've got to be honest with you. I agree with if people wish to assist to die, fine. I agree with that. OK, yeah. I'm with you 100%. on that. 100%. But I have a problem. OK. When we had this COVID, yeah? Yes. Right? How is it our government yeah, sent old people to old people's home? They, they, that isn't assisted dying. They, they made that happen. It was so one of the most colossal mistakes, it, wasn't it? it? Yeah. I mean, look, that was not a plot to kill people. Uh, that was incompetence. And I think all the evidence shows they were making decisions with no evidence that uh, not testing people and, and it led to the premature deaths of people. Um, I think it's a yes. different subject. I do think it's a no, different it's, subject. It's, it's not a different subject because it's not assisted. They assisted it. Because they they don't want to pay for uh, OAPs. No, I don't. I don't buy That's that, what they Paul. Did. Paul, no, I don't buy that. I mean, where's no. your evidence? It's there. Well, There's no, you're saying what happened. That's the motivation. It's the motivation, Paul. There's. I don't see any evidence for that. Oh, have you gone? Oh, okay. Well, I was enjoying that conversation. Um, 
Let's go to Janice in London. Lots of Janices today. Hello, Janice. Hello, hello, Nick. First of all, I wanted to say I think you've become a most marvellous presenter. Oh, thank you. Oh, I, I adore your program. Oh, thank you. Janice is my mum. If anyone's listening, <laughs> that's very kind of you. Thank you. Now, I'm going to very quickly tell you about a sister dying. Yes. My mother was very desperately ill and she was 96 and they wouldn't help her to die they just left her to die like a dog in the hospital the minute she died this was 10 years ago i actually took a do not resuscitate out for myself uh, and I, i'm now very ill and at the minute i can't go to switzerland because i can't really afford it and i can't get anyone to go with me so really assisted dying has got to come in i'm so sorry to hear that on every level uh, janice that 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 has happened and if you are lending your voice as you are to this debate I promise you to make sure your voice is heard because um, I think this is going to come more and more of an issue. I'm very sorry to hear about your circumstances. Tell me about your mother. Um, oh, my mother was, she had a stroke when she was 90. She couldn't talk, she couldn't move, she couldn't walk, she didn't know anything. She lay till she was 96 in hospital. If she'd have known how she was, she'd have wanted to die. Do you know, Janice, I, I, I don't want to distress you with this, but when I spent 12 days in a hospital, as it turned out, completely erroneously, that's how incompetent everything was, right. I was on two, uh, three wards. Uh, two of those wards, I was by far the youngest patient, and I'm 65. I was on men wards, and these men, I just... I closed my curtains at one point because the indignity of what these people were going through, they were literally um, being kept alive in the most indignant circumstances. I wrote an article on this. Effectively, um, men are ending their lives in nappies on a hosp hospital bed with no one really there to interact with them or whatever. That is not what this country should be about. Uh, I was horrified. No, I must say, my mother was in a top London hospital. They, they wanted to keep her going. It was ridiculous. Mm. It was ridiculous. But never mind. But myself, I've now got my do not resuscitate. I can't go to Switzerland because I've got no one can take me because oh, they'll I, get into trouble. And I don't really I want know, to spend and that's, all, that's I know, and that's the absurdity of the law. Money. That's the absurdity of the laws at the moment, exactly. I'm afraid. That's why we've got a press switch. We've really got a press Well, we will. And Janice, keep listening. I'm going to do this subject. In fact, I, I can confess that someone on the team said you don't want to do this subject. And the calls are flowing in. And I'm really pleased and I hope we can lend voice to you. Janice, thank you for your kind words to me. But more importantly, uh, you know, stay strong and yes, keep listening. You're marvellous. Oh, bless. Thank you. Um, let's go to... I'm quite touched by that. Let's go to Jeff in Wakefield. Jeff, on the same subject. Yeah, Assisted Dying. Yes. Um, 25, 25 years ago, the Pope said, um, this devalues life. He said all life is of... All human life is of value. Um, how would it be carried out if, if doctors have the power over life and death. But they don't. And We're not giving the power to the doctors. That is not the point of it, Jeff. That's definitely not the point. The point is the individual makes the decision free of pressure and that decision uh, is theirs and theirs alone. So you'd just be able to go to a clinic and... Uh... No, you've got no. And, and let me give you that example. You may not have uh, been able to hear it. So um, a, a relative of ours chose was was very ill had had really serious problems was was uh, was terminally ill and went through uh, yet another dreadful experience as part of that illness declined treatment in the hospital where he'd been taken the doctors agreed okay so his family agreed and he wanted to go and he wanted to say goodbye but he couldn't end his life he ended up by refusing medical treatment, spending six, seven days starving himself effectively to death. That's not civilised. Well, now that neither is assisted. Well, I think assisted. it is. I think assisted is, with, with all those precautions. Well, did you tell us, on average, it costs about £10,000 to end? Um, would it be so... 
what what exactly would happen? You've you've got me now. Well, uh, so well, it's just it's look, I. I the only thing I can't tell you is physically how it happens, but we all know from what you read in the papers that you take a, a cocktail of, 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 of drugs and slip away when you go to these places in Switzerland. I can't remember what the name of the place is. Dignitas, I think it's called. We don't have that. We don't have that law. Um, and if it was made legal, you could actually look at the most um, humane method of doing it, but only for people who choose it. I don't know what cost you're referring to. I haven't mentioned anything about £10,000, I don't think. Well, according to what I've read online, Digitalis on average, it, it costs about £10,000. To do what? In fact, I've heard about £20,000. Sorry, to, but, to do what? To end your life, to have assisted dying. Well, I, 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 no, I think if you go, I think uh, probably if you go to one of these clinics in Switzerland, it probably does cost a lot of money. We're not talking about that. The proposal that's come forward and, and it's been advocated by um, this broadcaster, Esther Ranson, who herself is terminally ill, is basically to legalise it here. So effectively, the medical profession, those who wish to, could be part of the process. Um, and I don't, I don't, I, I, I again, I may, uh, it, because it's not law, I can't tell you what it is, if you understand what I mean. So I don't think it's a cost. But if you do want to get into the cost, what does it cost to have someone left to effectively starve themselves to death in a hospital for six days in the NHS? I'll tell you what, it'd be a lot more than £10,000. Listen, Jeff, thank you for the discussion. This is not an easy subject to talk about. And I'm really grateful yeah. for those who have uh, joined the conversation um, uh, to do that. I'm going to uh, just read out a few messages now. And I know we will be coming up at the top of the hour, of course, to Trisha Goddard. Uh, and um, I'll be uh, talking to her very briefly. But let me go through some of these messages, if I may. Um, just where we are at the, um, the messages. I honestly can't remember the last time I walked into a space that was white only, including theatres and the ballet. This is dangerous nonsense. Also, I know very many people, including my husband, who never go to the theatre, ballet, opera, etc. Love the show, says Sally. Um, lots of people obviously talking about that. Uh, and um, I, I can assure you I'm getting just as many messages talking to me uh, about um, assisted suicide. I agree with um, assisted dying, but not what they are planning. Um, please look at calend uh, Canada and you will see that it has been expanded. And we covered that off, Carl, about assisted dying. And the interesting thing about this, it is being expanded in uh, Canada, but the reality is there doesn't seem to be huge objection to it because the law is still in place. In fact, expanding the law uh, would suggest that, popular is the wrong word, but that actually the population are comfortable with it. So, uh, again, I suppose what I'd be saying there, if it had failed as an experiment, wouldn't they have revoked the law in Holland, for example, where it exists as well? And at the moment, they haven't. This is a debate that we will continue with uh, and keep going. Let me just read out. Uh, an awful lot of comments coming in about the play um, where they were proposing to have black-only audiences in fairness it was BAME audiences and they've refined what they've said they've made it clear actually they wouldn't exclude anyone from that um, and this is interesting from Cat in London as an actor having a play that seems to want to exclude white audiences is hypocritical can you imagine if it was the other way round? it's hard enough to get work as a jobbing actor regardless of your creed without being pushed aside for being a certain race or colour the performance is marketed, marketed poorly and is coming across as a one-sided virtue signaling. Performances are for everyone. I think that's absolutely true. Uh, what I'm not actually clear about is there's a big part of me that thinks this is a marketing effort because we are all talking about it. And isn't that the, the, the reality of what's going on? Um, we're now talking about a show uh, that would none of us would have known about, least of all, Black and minority ethnic shows would have known about. Um, so maybe they've done their job. Maybe 
we're the daft ones because we're all talking about it. We've also spent a lot talking about uh, our democracy. Uh, I'm afraid our democracy is at severe risk. The Rochelle result has shown exactly that our MPs have all been too busy virtual signalling and posing with migrant welcome signs whilst we have been taken over. I don't think we've been taken over. Our democracy is at threat. That's a legitimate claim. Uh, and now they feel threatened. We're expected to foot the bill for extra security. Why, says Barry? Well, yes, you should expect to pay the bill to protect your MPs when they are being threatened. That is the bottom line. That's exactly... Um, uh, we can't have a situation just because we don't like MPs who may have made decisions that you don't like not being protected when they're facing threats. Are you really arguing in that call, Barry? Which I don't think you are, to be fair. Are we really arguing uh, that Sir David Amos shouldn't have had protection? Of course not. We wouldn't do that. Or Joe Cox. Th that they, These people were murdered. Now we've got people actually carrying out the threats. I actually think that we should be extending more security. And frankly, we're one of the few countries that don't offer um, a, a substantive level of security to MPs. I'm really unhappy about it. The reason I'm unhappy about it is because I think it causes